and welcome to the regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting for the Ashcash Area School District. Uh, this meeting is live streamed to the public on the Oshkosh Media YouTube page at www.youtube.com backslash C backslash Oshkosh Media. Uh, are we in compliance with open meeting law notification? Yes, we are. Thank you. Please call the roll. Carla. Here. Herzog. Here. Carnes. Here. Peschel. Here. Salaji. Here. Wright. Here. Wyman. Here. We have a quorum. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite um, um, Mr. Logan Taylor and Alex Taylor from Tipler to uh, come on up and uh, to lead us all in the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would please rise. And gentlemen, when you're ready, go ahead and lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to have children leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And so we, uh, we encourage kids to come to our meetings and to be involved um, in their schools as well as in their communities. So uh, welcome. Thank you. And Alex, thank you. And you and you're welcome to stay if you wish, but if you would like to go, we understand. <laughs> All right, please give me one second here. All right, so next up, um, Mr. Davis, if you could yeah. come up. Thank you. Um, we have a recognition of Herb Cole <coughs> Foundation Award recipients. And so um, as I read your name and description, uh, actually let me step back. We are recognizing students and staff today uh, who will all be beneficiaries of a Herb Cole um, Education Foundation grant. And so um, as I call your name, uh, please come on up and, uh, and stand, uh, stand over here. So, all right. Um, the Oshkosh Area School District is proud to have three Oshkosh West seniors, one Oshkosh North senior, and three Oshkosh Area School District staff members recognized as 2022 Herb Cole Educational Foundation Award recipients. Our student, we have four student excellence scholars. The following four high school seniors were recognized as student excellence scholars for their academic excellence and leadership. These students are among 140, 174 recipients who received $10,000 scholarships from the foundation. Uh, first up is Annika Larson. Annika Larson is a senior at Oshkosh West High School. She is a leader in student council and mock trial and is also involved in the community in community organizations focusing on restorative justice and music. She serves as a public defender for local teens and enjoys playing the <coughs> oboe in the Oshkosh Youth Symphony. Annika is passionate about civil education and, and has in introduced legislation at the state level. Her civic initiative, Let's Vote, has now grown to several states. Annika also works for the League of Women Voters and has served as a youth delegate to the U.S. Senate in 2021. Annika looks forward to studying anthropology at Dartmouth College this fall. Congratulations, <laughs> Annika. Yes, I will. Do we want to do that now or? Yes. Yeah. Hold on, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, and then we'll all stand up here and then just get one. Our next student is Sydney Butts, a senior at Oshkosh West High School 
who is headed to Indiana University next year to double major in biology and Spanish on the pre-medicine track. Sydney has been involved in many clubs and organizations at Oshkosh West, including the Global Academy, Mock Trial, Track and Field, Twirl Team, and the Spanish Club, along with leading the Student Council and the Rotary Clubs. Sydney's immersive childhood experiences within the Oshkosh volunteer community have led her to live a service-filled life, volunteering across Oshkosh for the day-by-day -day warming shelter, St. Raphael's, and Father Cars, along with other organizations. She is passionate about performing for others and has done so through Julie's Touch of Silver and the local and local children's theaters for many years. She will continue to do so next year with, I, with Indiana University's esteemed marching band, The Marching 100. Congratulations. Our next uh, student is Angelina Wang. Congratulations. Angelina is graduating from Oshkosh West High School this spring after completing all of her course requirements in three years, including multiple AP and CAP selections. She's a world champion baton twirler who has been missed has, sorry, who has been Miss Majorette of Wisconsin five times. She has twice won the Wisconsin State Championship for piano and also plays the violin. Angelina is a member of the Oshkosh Area, Area School District Gifted and Talented Art Program, a member of the O'Neill National Honor Society, founder and president of the Oshkosh West K-Pop Club, and a member of the Oshkosh West Student Council. For the past two years, she has been preparing a weekly home-cooked dinner for the residents at Father Carr's Place to Be. Last summer, she completed an internship in Lyme disease research at Drexel University College of Medicine. She plans to continue her scientific studies in molecular biology and stem cell research at the University of California, Berkeley, where she has been admitted for this fall semester. Congratulations, Angelina. <laughs> Next up, I would like to invite up Emily Heider. Emily is a senior at Oshkosh North High School. She has been a member of the school's Pride Student Leadership Group, a member of the Equestrian, sorry, Equestrian, can you say it for me? Equestrian. Thank you. <laughs> Club, and also participated in the school's Hispanic Honors Society organization. Emily is passionate about music and has been involved in the Oshkosh North Choral Band and Orchestra programs throughout all four years of her high school experience. Additional musical opportunities Emily has engaged in were memberships of the Madrigals, Spartanettes, and the Fermata Nowhere Small Group Ensembles, and Small Group Ensembles. She is honored to accept this scholarship and looks forward to attending co college this fall, double majoring in music, piano, and biology. Congratulations. Oh, sure. <laughs> 
so those of you uh, students who are just recognized, if you feel that you need to, to go and do what you need. I know there are activities going on tonight, so if you feel <laughs> you need to go, please go ahead and go. So. Um, next up, we uh, will be recognizing uh, the teacher fellows of the Herb Cole Educational Foundation um, uh, recipients. Uh, three district staff members were also recognized for their ability to motivate uh, and their leadership and service within, the outs within and outside of the classroom. The staff members will each receive a $6,000 grant and their schools will also receive a matching grant. So, uh, first we have Mara, Mary Beth Connors, who is the Oshkosh Area School District Special Education Transition Coordinator for the Oshkosh Areas for the district. Um, number two, we have Gillian mm -hmm. Pakula, is th who is the Dean of Students for Oshkosh West High School. And then number three, we have Kaylee Heidemann, uh, who is the counselor at Carl Traeger, Carl Traeger Elementary School. Congratulations to all of you. to add since this is on the agenda that um, I heard someone one time say that, that they were lucky to win a Herb Cole Foundation Award. There's a lot more than luck that goes into this award. I've been a reader twice for these awards on the on the state level both for students and for staff and the phenomenal individuals who are nominated is just astounding and to have three staff members from this district chosen this year and four students is just amazing. I get goosebumps just telling about that. So when you think about the seniors um, who will be receiving awards at our two high schools, local awards or regional awards in the next few weeks, and then you multiply that by the thousands of students across the state of Wisconsin, and we have these award winners in this district. Is, it speaks volumes about the quality of, of mm -hmm. our staff and our students. So um, I'm just thrilled, and I hope you'll join me in giving them all another round of applause. So the, the Oshkosh Area School District is uh, very pleased to, um, to have the Teacher of the Year. Uh, here with us, Carly Heidemann. Um, she was recognized uh, last week as well at her at her home school. Uh, it was covered in the local press, uh, Facebook as well. It was everywhere. Uh, congratulations on that. So, um, so with that, um, the 2023 Teacher of the Year Award uh, goes to staff uh, to a staff who has received a Herb Cole, Fel Herb Cole Fellowship Award. Um, for, sorry, I'm just going to read what's here. So, uh, the Teacher of the Year Award, staff who receive the Herb Cole Fellowship Award are eligible to be considered for Teacher of the Year Awards from the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Honorees are selected by a diverse committee to represent voices, contexts, and perspectives as educational leaders throughout Wisconsin. The Teacher of the Year's spend the following year serving as a representative of teachers in public education. Uh, they attend several ceremonies in their honor, engage in ongoing professional development as a, as a cohort, and participate in many local and statewide activities. We are pleased to recognize Kaylee Heidemann, Carl Traeger Elementary School Counselor, for being named the 2023 Teacher of the Year. Uh, State Superintendent Dr. Jill Underly, along with students and staff, presented Kaylee with this honor at a surprise 
uh, ceremony last week, Wednesday, May 4th. Congratulations. So we are now on to the part of the agenda where uh, we recognize, again, are recognizing students for their, their service to, um, to, to the board. So uh, we have the great uh, luxury and opportunities and experiences to spend a year with two student leaders uh, every single year. Um, and so as history calls from the board is that we recognize them every year provide them with a plaque of their service and uh, are provided a, a wonderful book called Robert's Rules of Order. <laughs> it, is, um, it, it, is, it is exciting from beginning to end. So, um, but um, it's a good opportunity uh, knowing, all of, knowing both of you and knowing where you're going, this book will probably come in handy at some point. So, um, so with that, I would like to recognize two, the two student board representatives for the 2021 school year. Um, and I would like to recognize Elise Liskey, the Oshkosh North, <coughs> which over here, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the next I would like to recognize Annika Larson if you would come on up both of these students have put in a year's worth of service um, you know, in the midst of everything else that they've done throughout the year through their, their school careers. So. So next up, we have uh, the approval of the agenda. This is a, typically a time in the meeting where if uh, board members wish to move um, items around on the agenda to accommodate um, the room, uh, we have that opportunity. Is there any wish to, to, uh, to amend the order of the resolution, the order of the agenda tonight? Yes, Mr. Peschel. Okay. I would like to suggest that we discuss moving the agenda related public forum to after the workshop that we have this evening. Okay. Is there any discussion on that? Well, don't we need a second to discuss it? We should. We should check okay. the book. Yeah. So <laughs> Can we borrow so your book? There's been a motion <laughs> to move non <laughs> to move agenda related <laughs> public forum to after the workshop. Is there a second? No. I'll second. Open for discussion. Okay, well, since I suggested it, my thinking behind it was Barb, or Dr. Herzog and Dr. Davis and I attended the CISA legislative breakfast. And during one of our breakout sessions, we were talking about community engagement and sometimes how it is helpful for if you're having a workshop on an issue to save the commentary for after the workshop. So because some of the questions or concerns that community members might have might be addressed in the workshop or they might want to um, change their comments or add comments or ask 
we're, well, we can't have a dialogue with them, but it just gives them an opportunity to maybe hear what we're going to say in the workshop. So that was my thinking behind the move. Okay. Any other? Go ahead, Dr. Rizal. I'm wondering if there are any uh, individuals who have signed up to speak right. in the public forum this evening. Well, that's a great good question. No, so, no. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Okay. So I withdraw my motion then. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I think I, I, I understand where you were, you were coming from on that. My, my concern was if we had people here, particularly people with young children, mm. um, they might want to speak first and then leave and then watch the rest of the meeting from home or at a later time. But mm -hmm. Anyway, it's not, not an issue to me. Yeah, I should have checked the list first. No Point of order. <laughs> Since we had a first and a second, we still need to go through the voting of it, and then it'll fail. But we had a first and a second, so we need to. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Perfect. Thank That's you. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, no. Carnes. No. Peschel. No. Salaji. No. Ray. No. Wyman. No. Carlin. No. Motion fails. All right. Um, moving on to board administrative reports, um, I have. I'd like to recognize um, staff who are retiring at the end of uh, the school year here. Um, so first up we have Nancy Levesque, sorry. She's a media assistant at, Osh at Oakwood Elementary School um, and has been with us since 2005. So congrats on your retirement. Mary Jo Vanderloop. Uh, is a cross categorical teacher teaching assistant at Carl Traeger Elementary School and has been with us for two th since 2003. So thank you both for your time and service to the Oshkosh Area School Districts School District, its students, staff, and families. So, is there anyone else that would wish to make any remarks from the board? I was just going to say, um, as a parent over at Oakwood, Ms. Levesque has had all of four of my students um, every year because she's the library media assistant and we actually just the last board meeting um, recognized her as a support staff of the year so it's just a great career that she's had a great way to end it and she will be missed Dr. thank you I just want to say thank you to these people for the years that they put in to, uh, to the success of our students and wish them a long, happy, and healthy retirement, and hope that we get to uh, see them in person at the retirement dinner coming up um, in a few weeks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I also had, I had Mrs. Levesque when I was a kid mm -hmm. at Oakwood, and yeah, it was she was great. We all we all loved her. She was the best. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you to her for everything she's done for Oakwood and our community and our students. Thank you. Any other last comments? So again, uh, thank you to both of you for, for your long um, storied history with the Oshkosh Area School District. Next up we have the superintendent's report. Mr. Davis. Yes, um, so it looks like Oshkosh West is up first. Um, so uh, I'll kick it over to uh, Annika. All right, it is kind of long tonight, but it's my last one. So I figured I might as well get as much time as I can <laughs> speaking. <laughs> um, not going oh there we go here we go prom <coughs> we had prom um, so that was this past weekend the theme was a night on cloud nine so hundreds of wildcats showed up for a fantastic night of music and games and dancing and we just want to say thank you so much um, to our prom committee who organized the entire thing put it all together um, it, it truly would not have happened without them so a big a big thank you to them so our FFA recently held a plant sale. So um, FFA students grow vegetables, flowers, all sorts of different flora and fauna in our greenhouse at Oshkosh West. Um, and then they're able to sell those plants to raise um, funds. So thank you to everybody who bought plants, who showed up, and thank you to our FFA for making our community a lot more beautiful. Ah, oh, this is my favorite. So last night, Oshkosh West hosted an art show featuring many of our very, as you can see, very talented mm -hmm. artists. 
Um, so congrats to everybody who participated. Um, and a big thank you to the culinary department also who provided appetizers and desserts. It was a fantastic night. Um, and as, I, as you can see, it was really great to celebrate the, the talent we have at West, because there's a lot of it. <laughs> I could never do any of that. <laughs> There we go. All right, so baseball and softball seasons are well underway. Our baseball team is playing at Appleton West tomorrow at 4.30, and our softball team is playing Fondy at home tomorrow at 4.30 as well. Our tennis team is having a fantastic season. They've been playing <laughs> in Milwaukee and <laughs> Madison invites. Um, as, you can see, as you can see, many of them are very avid chess players. Um, also, very notably recently, our one doubles team of Patrick Gannon and Anders Larson beat Powerhouse Middleton. So, congrats to them. That, that happened at the Nicolay tournament this past weekend. Our track runners have also been very busy. Um, several of them have made a lot of PRs in this past week. We had a lot of 100 runners PR, um, which is great as they approach the end of the season. Um, last year, our boys team took home um, the runner-up title in the state. Um, so we, we wish them best of luck as their, their season kind of moves towards that end. Oh, there we go. Um, and then also, recently, we had three, um, or we had our swimmers break three school records, which was incredible. Um, so congratulations to all these girls. Um, they're fantastic swimmers, they're fantastic students, they're fantastic people. Um, a lot of them, I think all of them, yeah, all of them in those photos have swum at national tournaments and they're just, they're fantastic. So congratulations to them. So, uh, a big thank you to Oshkosh North for hosting the Wildcat Cafe pop-up recently at the 5K. Um, Dr. Herzog is in that photo. I, I believe you look closely <laughs> enough. I was hoping no one would notice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's right. Um, yeah, so we, we love the Wildcat Cafe at West. We were very happy to share it. Um, and speaking of, do you guys know what most of the profits from the Wildcat Cafe go to? Care days. Oh, oh, did you want me? <coughs> oh. That's fine. I got it. Care days. Uh, care days is coming up. Oh, so, if, so if you don't know what care days is, um, so care is an acronym that stands for celebrating abilities, rallying everybody. So in its event, it's an event for all OASD adapted PE students. So it includes a carnival, a track meet, a DJ, and more. It's a full school day. Um, I've gotten to participate before, um, helping set up, um, helping. It's it's just the best. Students from Global Academy, Student Council, Rotary Leadership Classes, and everybody at the Oshkosh West community comes together to make this event happen. Um, and it's truly, I think, the most the most special thing that um, uh, the Oshkosh West community is able to do every year. Um, and it's really fun, too. So we invite you all to celebrate with us um, from the school board. So opening ceremonies start at 9 a.m. on May 25th. So be there. We look forward to seeing you there. <laughs> Oh yes, yeah, so we recently had the spring play. Um, they put on Little Women. It was fantastic, and congratulations to um, all the actors who just worked really hard, everybody behind the scenes, and costumes, and um, everybody who worked hard to, to put this on. Um, we recently celebrated National Student Leadership mm -hmm. Week. Um, so thank you to all the student leaders who make West better. We were able to recognize them in several ways. Um, so yeah, congratulations to them and thank you to our student leaders and what, for all that they do for us. Um, also, um, our special ed classes um, had a recent visit from Mr. Scott or Curious George, as he may <laughs> more commonly be known. Um, so thank you, Mr. Scott, um, for really making everybody's day with that. <laughs> um, and then also, a little more celebration. I get to brag about my teachers in my school, which is always great. Um, so congratulations to West Teachers um, for winning the OESD Employee of the Year Awards. So um, Megan Mueller, who I did have as a freshman math teacher back when she was Miss Sari, um, and Miss Motor are the second year teachers of the year, and then Nicole Beck is the first year teacher of the year. So they're all fantastic. Congratulations to all of them. They're also deserving. Then also, Oshkosh West was recently named one of U.S. News and World Report's best 2022 high schools, which is just, it's a huge honor for us. Um, and it, I mean, we, I, I get to come here every month and talk about all the good things going on at Oshkosh West. And so um, it's a huge honor to see it 
recognized at such a level like that. So congratulations to all the staff and all the students because it's really a, a, a community, right? We couldn't, we couldn't do that without a great community. And the Oshkosh, was, Oshkosh community in general, sorry, before I neglect to mention that. So, and then we also have our music department. Um, so it's been a great year in our Oshkosh music department, especially in our bands. Um, so this year, um, they actually got to travel to Disney World where they were invited to perform. Um, we've marched at several holiday parades. Um, they've had dozens of performances, actually including two concerts in this past week. And then this Friday, all four bands are headed to Carroll, or this Thursday and Friday, let me correct myself. They're, all four bands are headed to Carroll University to compete in the Wisconsin School of Music Association's large group festival. So best of luck to our bands. Last time they competed, they all um, they all actually won. Um, um, d like d uh, it, it's called a one award. It, it just means you're the best. So <laughs> they all got ones in the highest category possible, and I know that they're all going to do fantastic on Friday. So best of luck to them, and we are so so proud of our band programs and all of our music programs. And then I now get to introduce, because it is my last time, um, our our new uh, student. Leaders, sorry, what are you guys called? What are we called? What am I called? <laughs> Officers. Officers, thank you. I was blanking on that for a second. So, um, we have Tessa Whitcomb, who I brought with me today. She's going to be the new president. And Tessa's amazing. She is dedicated. She's a fantastic leader. And you guys are all going to love her. She may upstage me at several presentations, I think. Um, she's fantastic. So, you guys are in fantastic hands with Tessa. Um, we have Abby Fursey as our vice president, so she's very active um, in an environmental group at West um, and does a lot with volunteering in our community, so we're really excited for Abby as well. We have Ben Grill, who's going to be the secretary next year, um, and he's very involved in robotics, which is awesome. And then lastly, we have Kate Conger, um, who I know very well from the tennis team, and she's fantastic. She's so nice, um, and you guys, I think, are going to love our new officers, especially Tessa, who we will get to see every month next year. Um, so yeah, I just want to just also say, just say thank you to the school board, um, because it's really just been an, a, a life-changing experience. I don't know, just to get to see all the details about how school districts work, um, it's really been enlightening and interesting and um, a huge honor um, to get to sit in this chair for, for the past school year. Do have a calendar of events. Sorry guys, I'm gonna go on a little bit longer. So our senior awards night is May 18th at 6.30 in Alberta Kimball. So if you wanna see seniors win scholarships, woohoo, you can go to that. Um, so we have diversity day coming up at Oshkosh West. I'm gonna read everything that's going on. So it's super exciting. Um, so we, I'll read you all the performances. So there's gonna be a Hmong dance group, a K-pop club performance. Um, and then we actually have one of our foreign exchange students who's from Morocco, he's gonna give a speech um, about foreign exchange and about um, his African Heritage Club. So that's especially exciting. There's also going to be a fashion show um, featuring um, global fashions. Um, the, I think the culinary department is going to participate. So there's so much going on at Diversity Day. Um, it's during second and third hour on May 20th, which I believe that starts at 9 a.m. So about 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. 11 a.m. or something. I, I couldn't tell you. The bell rings and I go to the next class. <laughs> um, so we also have Music Awards Night, um, which is on at which is on May 23rd at 6 p.m. in the Over at Oshkosh West. Care Days, like I mentioned before, on the 25th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at West. Graduation on the 27th, and then you can come see the Oshkosh West and the Oshkosh North bands perform in the Memorial Day procession at on May 30th at 9 a.m. And with that, I guess I, that's my last presentation. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you for everything. All right, please. Well, hello and happy May. I have the uh, Oshkosh North Good News Report. Okay, so starting off strong, we had our Hall of Fame and Academic Awards ceremony a couple weeks ago, and Oshkosh North 1992 graduate Representative Gordon Hintz was inducted into the Hall of Fame as well as many of our sophomores, juniors, and seniors receiving academic awards to be recognized for their hard work throughout their years in high school. And it was a very wonderful ceremony. Um, 
This past weekend, we had our spring play called All's Well in Roswell, isn't it? Um, it was a very fun play, a comedy about aliens, real and fake aliens, and it was a great success. And a fun fact about this play is that we were going to perform it two years ago, right before the shutdown. So we were all very grateful to oh. be able to actually perform it. And about half the cast was originally in the show two years ago. Our Appreciation Week, Student Council celebrated the past few weeks. So we had our Teacher Appreciation Week, support staff, and custodian. And you can see uh, passing out flowers. And the culinary classes also provided a lunch for our staff. And there were also various gifts of gratitude throughout their weeks of appreciation. And we are very grateful for all of our staff and everything they do for us. The blood drive was a couple of days ago, which collected 83 units of, blo of blood, which is enough to save the lives of more than 200 people, and wow. that was a great success. The um, Communities One hosted a spaghetti dinner last Thursday, which was a fundraiser event to raise funds for um, children impacted by the Syrian war um, by helping alleviate their medical costs. And I do have to say, the spaghetti was fantastic. <laughs> there, um, they also partnered with the spring play, which was last weekend. So purchasing your ticket for the meal um, got you into the play. So it was an evening of dinner and a show. And it was great. About a month ago, we had our Jazz Appreciation Month concert, um, which was the North Jazz Band, as well as the jazz bands from Tipler and Merrill. And in addition to having the concert with all three ensembles together, the two middle school ensembles came to North during the day and worked with um, North students and in the, uh, in the building that they'll be in in high school. And it was, it was great to be able to meet um, future high school musicians. We had our state solo ensemble event a couple of weekends ago, and we had many students participate and many receive, as Annika said, the one rating, which is the best. We also had four students receive exemplary soloist awards and one receive an ex exemplary soloist nomination, which um, shows just how great our music department staff really is. And last but not least, we also had prom a couple weekends ago, and it was it was great fun and. Um, we thank our prom committee for making it such a success, as well as post-prom. You can see in the top right, we had a hypnotist come, and that was a lot of fun to watch. So <laughs> it was a very great evening, and yeah. So our upcoming events, tonight actually, we have our music department awards ceremony, which is where I'll be heading in just a couple of minutes. Um, our spring band concert, our spring orchestra <coughs> concert, and then a very exciting event, the North and West Chorales as well as the Oshkosh Chamber Singers are joining together to perform um, Luke's by uh, Dan Forrest, which is a multi-movement work, um, along with an orchestra as well. And it's a beautiful piece of music. So tickets are on sale, and I suggest that you come and see it because it's going to be wonderful. We also have our Polaris National Honor Society induction ceremony, our senior awards night, our spring choir concert, and then to end it off strong, our graduation on the first. So thank you for having me this year. It's been really great. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Thank thank you. You. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you both for your leadership um, and your input. I know it's been invaluable throughout the years, so I just want to to recognize that. And, and also, in a, Elise is an especially humble um, servant. She played a starring role in the uh, Roswell play, um, which was fabulous. So congratulations. Um, it was. Uh, it was great, and I'll second the spaghetti was fantastic also <laughs> before that, because I got a chance to go on Thursday night. So uh, congrat congratulations, and uh, good luck with your awards tonight. Thank you. So, thank and Elise you. forgot to mention that she was one of those four students who won an exemplary award at the state solo ensemble contest. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Okay, with that, um, we'll move to the uh, superintendent's good news report uh, for tonight. Uh, first of all, the uh, Oshkosh West Social Studies Department awarded its first ever $500 scholarship to Oshkosh West senior Hunter Willis. The department spent a year fundraising to create uh, an endowed award for a graduating senior who intends to major in one of the social studies fields. So congratulations and best of luck to Hunter. 
The Merrill Middle School uh, community recently joined together to support uh, one of their own during a walk for cystic fibros fibrosis. Uh, the event was organized by Robbie Walker, a science teacher at Merrill, uh, to support Hazel Desitel, a sixth grader at Merrill. Students walked uh, around the Merrill neighborhood, neighborhood to raise awareness and support their classmate. Hazel thanked everybody for their support after each walk, or after each class walk, and said she felt like a celebrity. So, uh, congratulations on that uh, great event. Uh, fifth graders at <coughs> Carl Traeger had the honor of participating in the City of Oshkosh's uh, Arbor Day program. Students learned about the benefits of trees and helped plant one. Uh, then each student received a seedling to take home and plant. So good work. Uh, as a district, we continue to be marked nationally by, lead, by uh, being leaders in mathematics, professional development, coaching, assessment, and teaching. Uh, last month, our instructional support teacher math team attended the National Math Recovery Conference in Chicago, and three of our staff members shared their expertise. Uh, our presenters included uh, leveraging the brain states to maximize teaching and intervention, showcasing our summer math camp at Reed Elementary, and building administrators' capacity to recognize and understand formative assessment practices in, ma in the mathematics classroom. So a special shout out for our talented math team for their expertise and leadership. Uh, Reed Elementary recently hosted a bunny hop to celebrate the beginning of spring. Uh, the celebration included a small course uh, for students to do the bunny hop dance, uh, run through bubbles, and then have some fun creating uh, chalk masterpieces. It was a fun time by everyone, so great work. Uh, adult softball has had a long storied history uh, in, Osh in the Oshkosh Recreation Department dating back over 100 years. This summer, the department will have 47 teams participating in our, uh, this year's softball program. Uh, we are grateful to provide this opportunity uh, for community engagement and recreation uh, in Oshkosh and hope everyone has a great season. As was mentioned earlier, Oshkosh West students are excited to host this year's first ever Diversity Day and Fashion Show on Friday, May 20th, which is open to the public. The event is a collaboration between students in the schools of fashion and, in, uh, and interior design. Uh, Global, Global Academy, English Speakers of Other Languages, Library and Media Center, Senior Foods, and the Culinary Programs. Throughout the day, attendees can explore a variety of student-led presentations and displays, including sampling uh, cultural cuisine made by Oshkosh uh, West culinary students, and hearing from foreign exchange students and listening to African drum circles. A cultural fashion show will take place at 1, 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., the show will feature a variety of Oshkosh West students showcasing the many different cultures represented at Oshkosh West. Students design their own outfits and will be modeling them for this year's unique event. So good luck to everyone. And then finally, a list of uh, activities uh, over the last uh, couple weeks. So, and that concludes the uh, superintendent's good news report for tonight. Thank you, Dr. Davis. All right, next we are on to district administrator supplemental reports. First up we have uh, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh teacher recruitment strategies and planning uh, to be led by Dr. Davis and Ms. Conrad. Yeah, so I'll have uh, Ms. Conrad come up um, and uh, she's been uh, working hard with uh, with UW Oshkosh and, and also maybe have Dean Haling uh, could join us at the uh, at the uh, chair at the uh, table up there. Um, so one of the things that um, that we've been working on uh, from the beginning of the year is, is to try to continue to build the uh, uh, teacher pipeline, knowing that uh, recruitment and retainment of our staff is one of our high priorities in our uh, strategic plan, uh, and knowing that um, in every industry now, uh, recruiting recruiting employees is is uh, really difficult to uh, to be able to do. So we're very fortunate to have a, a really good partnership with UW Oshkosh and their and their uh, quality teaching program. Uh, so we early on I reached out and received um, actually some really good swag from Dee Haling in my first <laughs> visit in her office uh, and have followed that up with uh, with many meetings uh, both virtually and in person um, on, uh, on how we can do uh, how we can create that pipeline and, and make it uh, um, something that a career that's lucrative um, and uh, and to be able to keep people uh, uh, in Oshkosh to be able to support our schools so uh, so Julie's taken the lead um, on, uh, on that program so I just um, ask her to be able to go through through um, some of the uh, the work that we've been doing with the uh, with UW Oshkosh and teacher right. recruitment. So absolutely, the Oshkosh Area, Area School District and UW Oshkosh College of Education and Human 
resources. Um, has a long-standing history of placement of clinical students and student teachers within our school district. Um, it has been a great recruiting tool. Um, anytime that we can get clinical students or student teachers in our schools, um, we, we hook them with our wonderful students and the opportunities to, to do teaching. Currently, there is 38 student teachers placed just this semester in the Oshkosh Area School District. What we're going to be doing differently is going to be dipping down all the way down into our high schools and into K-12, starting to identify and help um, help populate the pipeline, so to speak, when it comes to education and those that would be interested in teaching careers. Did you want to add anything, Dean Healy? Um, well, I know you're going to have more to say, but let me just let me just start by saying how much we really appreciate the partnership that we have with Oshkosh Area School District. Um, we definitely know that we can't prepare uh, teachers without the help of the fabulous teachers here in the district. And so um, these ongoing discussions with, um, with um, Julie and Dr. Davis are really important for our college to um, knowing that we have common strategic um, goals addressing the teacher shortages and um, diversifying the teacher workforce and you know making sure that um, you know we can get more teacher quality teachers out there for our students so so one uh, one outcome of our meetings has been a, a very specific one plus three pathway um, from high school into UW Oshkosh or could potentially be into UW System School, but we're hoping um, UW Oshkosh. And so we are going to be unveiling that at our first CAP night. Um, that's with jun upcoming juniors and seniors on May 24th. And then also using that as a recruiting tool to say that we can get a leg up and a head start um, into the education career and many other majors at UW Oshkosh in our, in, in our UW system um, by taking CAP, Fox Valley Tech dual credit, and EP dual credit courses. One of the things that's been a, a focus um, from our conversations even early on is, is how can we make sure that we um, can have the, uh, the education program uh, produce students and graduates in four years um, to be able to maintain the integrity and the quality of, of the program, but also to be able to have that mirror um, other degrees that are at the university. So uh, fortunately, um, that's something that Dean Haling and her, her department have been working on um, to be able to, to get the credit requirement down to that four-year mark. Um, this actually, this uh, one by three program actually goes another step further um, to say that we we could have a, a four-year program but you could start at your senior year in high school so again to be able to try to expedite um, the uh, the uh, pipeline um, is really important and this is a really a really important move um, as, as we you know continue to touch base with our students who we know would be you know good teachers good coaches um, you know positive influences in our community have had good experiences um, and uh, in their in their schools and to be able to keep them uh, in the pipeline. So I just want to thank you for, for the work that your department has done, uh, Dean Haling, and, and, uh, and just the openness to be able to continue to work with us, because um, I think this is a really good uh, example, I think, of a win-win you know, for both of our institutions, um, and ultimately for our students and families, uh, where they can save some money and be able to, um, to uh, be able to, to be part of, uh, part of what we do moving forward in the future. So, so with that, is any, any questions? I mean, it, I just think this is a wonderful example of building our community. You know, at the Oshkosh Area School District is a part of the same community UW always, and for us to be able to build this community together um, is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So thank you both for putting in the time and work um, so that, uh, you know, we can continue to make the whole community even, you know, a better place. May I add one last point? Yeah. Um, one thing we're also working on and we're going to continue to have discussions is how do we, is, is there a way, is there a possibility that we can get student teaching as a paid experience? Um, because a lot of other majors and in private business and industry, they are paying their interns and currently our student teachers are not being paid unless we can get them into the Wisconsin Improvement Program, which supplies um, internships. Um, and that's difficult and isn't always a line up with um, what we need. And so that's one another avenue that we're exploring to increase that and populate the pipeline. Yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think another asset, not only the excellent staff at the university, but the upgrading of the education facilities. 
will make a big difference in terms of recruiting and retaining excellent staff and providing opportunities for our staff with bachelor's degrees and beyond to um, avail themselves of that new facility. So I'm excited for that and for the university for doing that. Ms. Carlin. Yeah, I had a question about, um, so fresh off the campaign trail, I did a lot of research on teachers and the teacher shortage. And I read somewhere that one in four teachers thought about quitting, quitting during the pandemic because it was so stressful. And then I also uncovered some research that says we pay our teachers less than um, Germany, Canada, Netherlands, Australia, and Ireland. And what we need to do, obviously, is it all comes back to paying them what they're worth, and teachers are incredibly valuable. So I'm just wondering, my question is, in a long roundabout way, is how, what are we doing to elevate the, the profession as a whole so that more people want to be teachers? Because being a teacher is the greatest job in the world. It's the, it's the job that creates every job, right? And so is there anything that the school board can do to help promote teaching as a profession? Because I know the numbers have declined and we have shortages and we have shortages of subs and we need to obviously pay our teachers more, but you know, that's the ideal, the dream. But do you guys have any input on that? I have a, co um, a couple different mm -hmm. thoughts. So first of all, in goal number five of our strategic plan, when we start talking about like community engagement and telling our story when it comes to the school district, it's a lot of times when you get called into education, it's through being, it's being touched, right? It's through the heart, it's like, it's your mission, it's in your soul mm -hmm. that you wanna work that you want to work with children and so getting our story out there and all the great things that were showcased tonight is is exactly one recruitment tool and t and really getting our story out there about how we make a difference each and every each and every day so um, I think that's like one of the number one recruitment strategies and then also elevating our educators and, and treating them very much like professionals and that's honoring them within the culture and climate of our school district and our school buildings um, when it comes to um, them as professionals and partnerships like this also exactly. help uh, yes and getting mm -hmm. paid student teaching and yep. enabling them to start their careers earlier and everything mm -hmm. like that so I'm very grateful for this partnership thank you very much I mean, I'm happy to also address that. I think um, you really hit on something that's important because teacher shortages are really not that new. I mean, it's you know have been around for a long time, but it is getting worse. And um, part of the problem is exactly what you say is that um, um, the perception of education and educators. And so I think it's really incumbent on all of us to um, talk about what Julie is saying to get. Um, teachers in the field talking to students more about the rewards of the profession and um, and parents to talk to kids about the rewards of the profession and um, that's what's going to help to elevate that this is this is a fabulous um, field you know mm -hmm. to to go into but we have to get that message yes um, out in the public and the countries I mentioned actually they pay their teachers as much as doctors and lawyers which I think is spot on because they are just as critical to a community as doctors and lawyers so thank you again mm -hmm. for your services to and your partnership with our district I appreciate it Mr. Carnes and then Ms. Wyman um, you said 38 um, student teachers in the district this semester. Mm -hmm. Do the majority of the student teachers from UW Oshkosh come into the Oshkosh Area School District? Do they go other places? We, we do have to go out um, into other communities because we have um, you know anywhere from 100 to 150 um, students a semester that we are pricing plus with clinical students and so um, a, you know a district like um, Oshkosh is is not only taking student teachers but then all of our yes. pre-student teaching clinical students as well and it's and it's a lot so it can mm -hmm. you know we, we have to spread that around a little bit but I think an important thing it also is one thing that Dr. Davis mentioned that what we do know is that um, taking those student teaching placements is really important for a district to address some of those teacher shortages because um, basically two-thirds of uh, student teachers will take their first job within 25 miles of where their teaching uh, student teaching placement is and then three-quarters of them within 50 miles and so um, it's important you know districts who are placing a lot of student teachers have are feeling less of that teacher shortage than other areas that are away from you know 
universities that are preparing and placing student teachers there. How does that number compare 38? What's our, do we average a certain number of student teachers? I don't know that number off the top of my head, but that's down because just overall enrollment mm -hmm. okay. in mm -hmm. the College of Education is So down. we could handle more than that number? Technically, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Wyman. Uh, thank you. I'm thrilled to hear about the four-year program. I think that'll go a long way in being able to have more people come into the program. What is the holdup right now about paying um, the internships or the student teachers? Is it a state issue? Is it a local issue? Where, where does it lie? Well, yes. Really who's going to <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it really is structurally um, how it, how it's originated to, to be non-funded. To be honest, so I mean, if you look at the history, the hi historical nature of, of teaching, student teaching, and teacher programs, mm -hmm. you know, they they were primarily um, you know normal colleges as UW Oshkosh started in primarily female um, positions, uh, which historically weren't deemed you know necessary to be able to provide compensation appropriately for those positions and so that's part of the legacy work that I think we need to disrupt um, in that so it really now for us to be able to look for funding sources um, so that's what we've been working on uh, I'm going to talk to uh, you know community members um, you know community leaders um, to be able to see if we can you know start to home grow maybe maybe an endowed fund or something like that for us um, and then also being able to work at a state level um, legislatively to see if we can find some um, some support because if we're going to if we're going to seriously address this and this isn't just an Oshkosh issue it's happening across the state um, there needs to be an acknowledgement of, of that deficiency just built in structurally for us and then to, to be to be able to make some allocations towards that so okay. thank you mm -hmm. so I, I guess I had one one comment um, in regards to the numbers that you had just kind of stated in regards to you know the percentage that that stay within 25 miles and the other percentage that stays within 50 um, and it shows about how much we as a district are invested in the type of program that that, that we're talking about here um, because that 25 mile and that 50 mile is a very competitive radius for the Oshkosh Area yes, School District, right? right? We have several school districts that are <coughs> within that 50 mile radius and so us being engaged as a community not only with our own high school teacher, high school students that may become part of that pipeline, uh, the ones that we know that are interested in becoming teachers, you know, finding a way to instill those ones that our, that our staff see that could be teachers mm -hmm. is really important too um, because I know that Sometimes, you know, a teacher will become a teacher after one career, you know, yes. they'll go back and they'll mm -hmm. do that. And so, um, and, and so it's a lifelong kind of uh, path mm -hmm. that we're trying to, trying to maintain there. And so for me, it's really important of getting those that we know want to become teachers, but then it's also getting those that we know mm -hmm. that would really be good teachers mm -hmm. and letting them know that in high school or letting them know that early on in college um, that I think is beneficial to us and if the Oshkosh Area School District is part of that process that gives us a leg up within that 25 mile and 50 mile radius of where those um, student teachers become teachers so thank you for your efforts on that yeah great thank you can I add one thank more you. thing you sure Bob you just made me think of something <clears throat> if if we do work on something at a, at a level that we can pay student teachers I wonder if Instead of people leaving the profession, <clears throat> you get people coming into the profession. You know how many people are close to getting their degree or they can go back and, and wrap something up and they know that I don't have to take a year off of work with a family to be able to do this. I can get some kind of, you know, to keep my family. So I, I think that there might be even a broader ability to recruit teachers at that point sure. that may come in with a lot more life experience too because they've been out there already. So I'm excited to see where that goes. So sure. thank you. Thank you. And I UW Oshkosh does have a program that will allow people to do just that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dean Halen can give you more information later. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's for second career individuals. It's called um, Alternative Careers in Teaching, our ACT program. And so it's exactly what you're describing, mm -hmm. those individuals who want to come back for licensing. And so it's kind of an accelerated program. But what you're describing is tough for them because they're working adults who have to take a semester off for student teaching and not be paid and it's 
it's it's hard to um, fit that in with their family needs. Mm -hmm. it, I think it just is my last comment. It's going to be so uh, key, you know, so instrumental uh, to be able to introduce uh, students to the teaching profession at, you know, in the high school level, because who truly knows, you know, what at that age, what a career is like or what it is or even what you want to do. I mean, in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I mean, like to give students that um, the ability to be introduced to something that they might learn to love, I think it's just could be really prove really beneficial and maybe it could be a prove be a te you know a pilot for what needs to go on regionally and nationally you know because uh, when you think of it how many different things you're introduced to for when you're introduced to something you don't know that it's really your thing and then you get that opportunity you know it could be life-changing so Thank you, Dean Young. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, next on the supplemental reports is a, uh, a draft of a, uh, a lease, um, again, with partnership with UW Oshkosh for uh, East Hall Park. Uh, and so um, just wanted to uh, kind of explain that a little bit. First of all, um, you know, it's a the draft of a lease for any discussion um, tonight. Um, uh, really important to note that um, the proposal is, is contingent on your approval, but also the approval of the University of Wisconsin Board of Regents, uh, which would happen uh, after, after your approval um, this, uh, this summer. Uh, it's an opportunity for the district to partner with UW Oshkosh on a long-term lease um, and allow for the construction of facilities to support co-curricular or recreational programs uh, potentially on that site. Uh, the lease terms uh, would be uh, 50 years at $1 a year uh, with two possible extensions of 20 years each uh, at $1 a year uh, for this property. Um, so the, uh, in the context of the Facility Advisory Committee, uh, who's been working on uh, looking at um, upgrading our co-curricular facilities, um, we believe that this, um, this location might be a good opportunity um, for us to put uh, potentially one of those uh, one or, or more of those facilities um, on this on this property. What we really like about this opportunity um, is that you, you very rarely, if ever, get you know an opportunity to uh, invest in Oshkosh at this scale um, in this property. And, and this property could uh, one, it gives us a clear accessibility between our two high schools. Um, it provides the opportunity for us to uh, take advantage of the kind of the consolidation concept and be able to have. Uh, have facilities for both, both North High School and West High School, uh, provides uh, public uh, access to uh, public transportation uh, because we know accessibility for a lot of our students is an issue to be able to take advantage of this. Uh, it also would be a great complement to the community. Um, and, and this would be a facility that uh, would be um, honestly primarily community uh, community access uh, between our seniors and our youth sports teams. Uh, that type of thing would be uh, potentially uh, some opportunities for this concept. So uh, I think it really it reinforces our opportunity to uh, to uh, start a mantra or continue a mantra of investing in Ashkash. Um, to be able to bring people to Oshkosh, showcase Oshkosh, um, and I uh, just want to thank the Chancellor for, uh, for being willing to uh, have those conversations, to be able to work with the Board of Regents, um, and just present this as an opportunity um, for the Board for discussion tonight. Um, and if we're you know, uh, supportive of the discussion tonight, um, we'll bring it back to the next Board meeting for potential approval. As I mentioned before, uh, this is also contingent on the approval at the Board of Regents level, so it wouldn't just be us, but uh, I think this is a, a good opportunity I wanted to be able to bring that to the board for uh, for discussion tonight. Go ahead. Any thoughts on what the likelihood at the Board of Regents approves it? I mean, has there been any? Yes, they're likely to approve it. Um, okay. Before we get too excited, I just want to talk. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I don't think that's, you, you can never tell what a board can do, uh, but you know, it's, it's certainly been lined up to be approved. Good. Thank you. Well, I think the uh, it's a no-brainer that this is a smart decision for us to to do. Um, it makes sense, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons: location, you know, the ability for us to um, utilize that space to provide, uh, you know, great opportunities for 
uh, our students, you know, and people that live in the community. Uh, it's, you know, a great opportunity, and I, I think it's a no-brainer that we should, you know, acquire and work with UWO to u use, get that space and then to utilize it so that um, our community and students can benefit from it. Is um, a recommendation of what would go there coming from the facilities committee? Um, yeah, it, so it's part of, part of the context of, of what the facility advisory committee um, will take a look at. So our next meeting is next Monday. Um, so that'll be the first meeting where, you know, this has been you know publicly available and able to talk through. So I think there's there's some uh, ideas of, of what could fit there. Certainly, um, you know the size of that facility, the the acreage, it's about eight acres. Um, so that kind of dictates what could go there and what couldn't go there. Outdoor facilities would be way too small, you know, for that. But you know, thinking about like indoor practice facilities um, and uh, might be an opportunity um, there. So yeah, so that'll it'll be part of uh, what will come out as the recommendations. Um, for, from the uh, facility advisory committee um, that'll come out in June. Um, they've got two more meetings left. I'm very excited about the possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, for the greater good, I wanted to highlight in the report that this is a no cost increase on insurance and maintenance cost, and the maintenance cost is similar to what is spent on maintaining Schmerth Field. Is yeah, that how you say Schmerth. it? So, yeah. for the greater good, I just wanted to put that out there and again um, say that I'm also excited by the opportunity. This is a fantastic location, and I think it's a great opportunity. Thank you for working on this. Great. Thank you. So I actually had a question that relates to that because um, are we not utilizing Shermuth Field anymore? No, I, so as well as, as we're making that transition at Bell Phillips, okay. Um, okay. so that would kind of off, oh, yes. offset, right? Yeah. Never mind. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So yeah. as we're going, so <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll offset. Um, yeah. As Got it. Before. All right. Because yeah. I, I guess I wasn't recognizing that as that field named yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah. thank you. I didn't know his name that either. Um, and that would have been my only question is that uh, I was questioning how that could be an offset if it's an existing field, but it's not anymore. So, all right, is there any other questions related to this topic? Do you feel that you've gotten the direction that you need to be able to move forward? Uh, yeah, I believe so. So, so we'll put this on the uh, agenda at the end of the at our next meeting for approval, similar to, to our cadence. Um, and then, upon your approval, um, then we'll move it forward to uh, the Board of Regents um, through uh, Chancellor Levitt. And then we should have an answer, I think, probably by the end of June, um, for uh, um, to come back and report to you on, on that final uh, final approval. That'll just be more of an update as we're moving forward and uh, the, the facility advisory committee will be wrapping up uh, in May um, and as was mentioned part of the their report will uh, likely include um, some recommendations for um, for East Hall Park um, as we're moving forward okay thank you great thank you thank thanks very much thank for coming thank you and for your support thank all right you. uh, next up is uh, uh, our COVID-19 update um, by uh, director Kammerer <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. So you may have noticed that uh, the COVID-19 report looked a little bit different for this board meeting than it has in the past. And the, the primary reason for that is the Wisconsin Department of Health Services recently changed the way that they calculate and report out on case rate as compared to how they've done it in uh, you know previous cycles. So. The DHS now uh, has adopted the, the CDC categories of low, medium, and high, and they base that on a, a seven-day case count versus the, the previous burden status that the DHS was used using was based on a 14-day case count. So uh, along with that, in addition uh, to the, the case rate, they look at the percentage of um, hospital beds that are occupied by COVID-19 patients. And that's also a factor that contributes to whether or not an area is determined to be low, medium, or high. So as of um, this past week, the, the seven-day case rate for the geographical boundary of our school district was at 208.9, but the, uh, the rate of hospitalization for COVID-19 patients in our area uh, rendered less than 10% of our hospital beds being in use for that purpose. So that placed us in the medium category um, in terms of um, uh, threat level for our area. 
To be more specific though, in terms of the number of cases for those who are under the age of 18, for the last seven day period, we have 43 cases. Uh, broken down even further, uh, if you look at uh, children under the age of five, there were two cases. For those between the ages of five and nine, there were 22. For those between the ages of 10 and 14, there were 10. And for those between the ages of five and 17, there were nine. So uh, this was an increase from the weeks prior, I believe it was a 22% increase. So there is a bit of a resurgence going on right now. Um, right now we currently have two classrooms that are virtual as well due to the number of uh, cases that um, were popping up in those classrooms. When you look at our district dashboard, which was last updated Thursday, May 6th, um, that also showed that we had 33 active positive cases at that time. 28 of those were students and 15 of those were staff at 16 different schools. Uh, one interesting piece to that, 31 of those 43 cases were at the elementary level. Uh, so really our, our secondary schools haven't been impacted as much this time around. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if that trend continues. Uh, but so far for this year, there have been 2,773 positive cases. Um, and there have been 90 uh, uh, cases that have been, uh, where there's suspected transmission within the school. And one last piece to note, uh, we do have vaccination clinics scheduled at Oak Lawn Elementary. Uh, the first is gonna be on Monday, May 23rd from three o'clock until five o'clock. And the second is gonna be on Monday, June 13th from three o'clock to five o'clock. So there's gonna be more information coming out. Those were just scheduled today. I just wanted to make sure that public is aware that we do have more clinics coming up. Any questions? No. Great. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is our budget variance uh, and ESSER funds uh, monthly updates. Uh, Director Nihans. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, the, the budget uh, report for this month is trending fairly similar to the way it has uh, since January. Uh, we're still trending uh, about 1.2% uh, uh, better than our trend for expenses. Uh, that would still trend out to be a little bit more than a million dollar surplus at the end of the year. Um, our food service department is still trending a little bit more than a $700,000 surplus. So they're, they're still performing well as, as well. Um, I do want to highlight in the report, this is the first time we've done reporting on the health and the dental insurance. Um, the dental was self-insured a year ago. Um, we didn't have quite the same access to reporting as what we do now. Um, and the health insurance, of course, just went self-insured in January. So it, it took a few months, and you can see from the report, um, the, the first few months there's very little claims because there's a, a lag period in between when, when you go to the doctor and when it actually hits your, your actual expenses. Um, which is also part of, part of the surplus for that report. So our dental report, uh, typically we would, we would uh, update that on a quarterly basis for the board. Um, that, that's a little bit smaller and a little more predictive, so it doesn't have as many changes on a monthly basis. So you can look from that moving forward as a quarterly report, quarterly update. Um, that plan isn't quite running where we thought it was gonna be running right now. Um, but it is still showing a surplus. We're running a, about a 96 loss ratio on, on that, so it's about a $15,000 surplus um, year to date. Um, typically, we would think that would be a little bit higher than that at, at this point. Um, our health plan is running just under a 40 loss ratio, uh, so for 40%, uh, which right now is showing a, about a $4.5 million surplus year to date. Um, that, that is expected, again, part of that is due to much of January and February, we didn't have a lot of claims actually hitting our, our experience yet. So that, that isn't out of the norm for, for starting a new plan. The ESSER report, there is really nothing different from, from last month. We didn't make a claim in the month of April. We are getting ready to um, start ramping up to make our final claims for May and June as we end the fiscal year and getting those. So the next two months we'll, we'll have quite a bit of activity on the ESSER reports, but, but nothing changed from last month on that one. Are there any questions? One, from a service standpoint, are we happy with the 
plan? The health and dental plan? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we, we had a, a tricky month getting through, um, especially on the pharmaceutical side. Um, we, we had a little bumps and bruises getting through there. Um, a lot of it was more on the communication and making sure that staff that have specialty drugs um, got into the right procedure to, to get those filled. Uh, we're using a different pharmacy benefit manager for that, and, and it's a little bit diff quite, quite a bit different than what we had through our fully insured plan. Um, but for the most part, um, I, I think it's gone pretty well. There, the comments and, and the customer service um, calls have, have considerably decreased. Thank you. No other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is our monthly referendum updates. Um, so we've got uh, Jim Fox and Nate Constantine um, from uh, Bray Architects. So, Jim, did you have a uh, presentation yes. at, as part of that? So if we could get that queued up. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, my not working. Is it working? No, it is not. Um, as you, you can tell before, it, it's not, and I don't understand okay. why you change batteries. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Let's draw this one. Somebody up here can Could just somebody run it from the back? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for our monthly referendum update, there are three topics that we would like to discuss, uh, excuse me, share with the board. Uh, first item will be shared by Nate Considine of Bray Architects. We wanted to touch on the value engineering process, which was really instrumental in kind of developing the scope of work that we're seeing currently under construction at Dell. So maybe would you share that? Absolutely. Uh, thank you again for having me tonight. Um, the Vell, or the uh, Vell Phillips Middle School project, um, just along with almost every project that was bid out in the past 18 months, you know, it did come a bit over over budget, and so the one of the processes that we do um, is something called the value engineering process. Um, what that what that means is um, okay. We, we came in over budget. We can look at two things. We can shelf the project, rebid it at a later point in time, which we fight inflation on, or we can take the bid if we're close enough, and we can work through um, what were the wants and make sure we decipher wants versus needs, um, and what are the, the needs that we can scale back um, from, you know, maybe driving, um, you know, uh, Alfa Romeo and, and put in a, a, a high-end Chevy, right? So something that's still going to do the job, it's going to be very, a very nice product at the end of the day, um, but, but we kind of, we took the, the fancy name off the tag. Um, so uh, kind of just trying to identify some of the processes here. Um, really there's kind of seven steps um, and so the first piece was is after identifying kind of where our overage was um, what we what our goal was to get to um, we identified areas within the building materials used in the building and the overall design intent 
um, and to see where we could scale back. Where, where are we um, driving the alpha and, and how can we get to the Chevrolet? I apologize if that's a bad um, you know, comparison. Okay. Hopefully you get my, it makes sense. my drift. Um, the, the second piece there is then um, we, after identifying those areas, materials, and design intents, um, we review that with the school district. We make sure that everyone's on the same page, that, okay, we feel like these are the areas that we can um, be interested in scaling back on. Then we reached out to the apparent low contractor, which in this case was Myron Construction. We asked for them for preliminary budgetary information based on those items um, that were early identified. Then we um, receive that, uh, that pricing um, and based on the value of what we had identified, we go through a pros and cons list. W where do we feel like is our best bang for our buck um, to scale back? Um, what was a surprise, what wasn't um, in this age of materials? Um, something that we thought was, was going to be a six figure cost savings due to the material issues of today was actually an additive to the project. We thought we were gonna save over $100,000 and it was a $20,000 add. And that just kind of, you know, something that is traditionally a cost savings to the project didn't work out that way because of materials. Um, so we, we are in a bit of a strange environment and stra strange time right now. Um, so anyways, we, we do that cost analysis of what are we trying to scale back and what is the dollar value? How does that then um, get us to the big picture? How can we assemble the puzzle pieces to, to get us to the number that is desired? And, and so that's kind of a, a we, I think there was two or three, four meetings that we went through to try to you know, facilitate where we could um, scale back. Um, at that point in time, uh, Bray kind of looked to OASD and said, all right, these, you know, these are the options. We can continue to look for options. Um, but it really look to the school district to you know make the best choice for you. We, we've tried to help you through the process, lay out the groundwork, and at that point OSD identified where the scaling back could and should occur. Um, at that point in time, um, we moved forward with the direction from OSD to revise the drawings and send to contractors for final pricing. Um, and we're still in the process of receiving that pricing from the contractors and what is still a very crazy material landscape right now. Um, but step six and seven are kind of, we're in midst of that right now. Um, but Bray and OASD reviews that final pricing. And then as long as things still are lining up the way that was projected in steps one through, one through five, um, then an official change order is written to the contract that was signed with Myron to reduce the total project cost. Um, and, and we move on with the project kind of uh, to a degree, partially redesigned, you know, scaled back, however you would like to look at it. Any questions on that, that seventh kind of step process? So I believe the next slide uh, goes through uh, the value engineering items. Um, some of these uh, probably are new to you and a few of these are not. Um, so uh, brick size, um, a roof edge material selection, so what looks like the top of wall, is that metal, is that stone, what is that material? Um, that was revised to, to save some, some dollars. Um, we did end up um, at least temporarily removing the bipolar ionization equipment. This is, um, this is one of those pieces that we are more or less interested in putting in buildings in the future. Um, if you're not familiar with bipolar ionization, it is a product that can be placed in anyone's HVAC equipment, whether it's at home, whether it's in your office, whether it's in schools, whatever it is. And it um, takes you from 98% of cutting down on pathogens going through the system up to 99.9. .9. So our current systems are, are very, very good at what they do um, just by using good quality filters. And that is what's being used in these projects. Um, and there's an additional dollar amount to get to that, you know, one and a half percent bridge from 98 and a half up to uh, 99.9. Question. Uh, yes. If you don't mind, not to interrupt, but what did uh, removing each of these items save? Do you know off the top of your head? So, um, as I mentioned, we're still getting final pricing back from, from my own construction. So I don't have those final numbers here for you today. Um, there were cost estimates listed to all of them, but in fairness of not telling you the wrong number, I'd hate for something yeah. to change. I just was curious because I, well one, I didn't know what 
bipolar ionization equipment was, but two, I was thinking, well, what did that extra 1.9% of um, purification or yeah, in the ballpark of, cost? For the so. Bell Phillips project, the ballpark was somewhere between two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars um, If my memory serves me right, does that sound right to you? It sounds right. So um, the goal on something like that would be is, you know, if we're being efficient um, in the way that the construction contingency, which is set out, right, that things are going to occur, um, such as soils or different things during the construction, that if, if that money is not fully used, that that product can be easily added at the end of the project, um, as that is something that I think the district is interested um, in doing in future buildings going forward. Um, but obviously, if you start to look at this list, you know, removing some, some finish requirements, um, removing bleachers, uh, revising bathroom wall tile, you know, some of the finish aspects, some of the thing, things like that. I'm um, looking at exterior materials, um, the big one removing the walking track as we had previously discussed a, m a month or two ago. Um, the bottom one is an elevator type re um, re revision that's in the blue. Um, there were a lot of hard decisions made. Um, I, there was not, I don't think, a single one of these that was an easy, yes, let, let's do that. Um, this building was designed pretty lean and clean um, from the start. And I think, I, I don't want to speak for Jim or the rest of OASD, but these were hard decisions. And, and this bipolar ionization one was an extremely hard one to say, it's a big chunk of change. We got we to gotta target the hit. You know, I, it's, it, this is a hard decision, but they felt like they had to do it. I mean, to me, removing bleachers and, I mean, it's all stuff I guess I wish we really had right you know because and I think seating at you know at games and um, like so a question then who like who makes like the final call when you're in a group and you're going through this value engineering to say while well, the bleachers are gone versus the whatever else I mean because that's I mean, that's all stuff on there, I think, for the most part, we'd all like to see, you know, so how does that process work? As Nate has said, it's a difficult process. You know, one of, the, one of the key concepts that we return to over and over again is whatever we do as part of this value engineering process, it can't impact education. And that was really our focus on this, on this entire facility. We had opportunities and directions that we could have gone that could have potentially impacted the number of classrooms we have or the size of classrooms. Uh, certainly the finish um, access to classrooms with uh, different sized doors and, and how classrooms can flow out into the open spaces but we we felt that it was really critical that we leave those intact they were designed by a much larger broader group of educational professionals and and that was really our core function our core mission as part of that building so we really really try to hone in on those things that would give us a fiscal savings without impacting that educational piece of Fellows. And, and that was a driver. And to a couple of the pieces that you touched on, such as bleachers or, or such as, I mean, this uh, bipolar ionization or like for instance, the site benches, those are all items that are pulled out for now. And if, you know, I, I know this is kind of wishful thinking to a degree, but those could all be added back in. The electrical infrastructure is there to support um, future bleachers in this location, things like that. Um, the, the hard part comes, right, when you remove a classroom, it's, it's very difficult or it costs a lot of money to add a classroom back into a building. Um, and I think one of the other difficult parts was removing the walking track. That was one piece that will be extremely hard to put back into this building. Um, so, it, again, uh, not an easy process. The district, we went through this for six to eight weeks trying to finalize it. Um, and uh, as mentioned, pricing is, is still in flux to a degree. Sorry, did you have another question? Yeah, you actually answered one of mine, um, but I had two. So the other one is I wonder, uh, and this is maybe more towards Dr. Davis, but so things like the site benches, are some of these items things we can maybe fundraise for or have people sponsor? I know like at some elementary schools around the city, the benches um, out on the playgrounds have like a family or a business name on them because they donated the money for those. Just wondered if we've looked at other options like that. 
Yeah, we, we haven't yet, but I think that is a good a good opportunity, again, just to be able to involve the community on, on certain things. I think we wanted to make sure, uh, you know, we can get our numbers back and, and right. find out exactly where, where we are. Because, um, again, if we have some good luck, we might be able to, you know, add some things in. But once we get a clear picture of that, um, yeah, I think there's certainly some things in here that would lend themselves to, you know, some of that uh, partnership. Perfect. And, yeah, so I appreciate that as you've cut these things, you've also made sure that there's an opportunity for them to be put back because I think the same thing about, like, the bleachers. Um, it's just nice to know I'm more comfortable cutting those out knowing that they can be added with additional funds later. Yep. And, I mean, the bleachers was definitely a hard thing. I, I am not concerned from a at this point in time I'm not concerned about public coming into this gymnasium and having a lacking of seating there's still a very large bank of bleachers in this gym um, that will support any sort of middle school activity um, the the piece that this unfortunately did was take um, what could have been a space for one or for the entire student body to be in and being able to seat on the bleachers and now they'll have to simply do two um, full you know to separate into two um, large like assemblies. assemblies. Yeah. That was that was actually part so of my other question. So that's that's kind of the big fist. impact to that. That's a problem. Just quick clarification. You said that all of this could be added back in at some point except the walking tra track. Like that's the train has left the station for the tra walking track, correct? Yeah. Um now I will say that there are some things on here that um you know like revising the brick size. Yeah. Like you can't quite do that, right? Right. Um and some of these other pieces like polish requirements, HVAC specifications um, some of those were areas that were maybe wants and we kind of scaled back to something that we felt more comfortable with and didn't have to, again, go with the Alpha. We got the, the Cadillac or the, or the nice Chevy. Um, you know, on this, you know, the bipolar ionization, the benches, the bleachers, um, add more tile, add more electrical cord rooms, um, you know, all of those things could be added back in. But not the walking track, though. But right? the walking track Is would take some substantial rework. rework. Um, I'll start with I'm still not happy the walking track's gone. Um, I understand the whole idea of making sure we don't touch the educational spaces. Completely agree with that. Still just not a fan of that. Um, the bleachers, though, made me wonder because we got two middle schools coming together in one. Yeah. So now yeah. if you do sports, you do activities, you do something in that gymnasium, you're going to have, if you do a wrestling meet, you're going to have twice the number of families for that school. And so that concerns me, especially when you said you can't do an all school assembly, yeah. you gotta split it. Yeah. To me, that does yeah. change the I, I think value. the piece that we talked about fundraising, that was a thought of mine as well. What can we do? Because that, that seems like that actually moves into educational mm -hmm. opportunities to be able to do mm -hmm. assemblies and speakers and things like that. So I guess I would, I would push back on that one a little bit. The walking track's gone. You know, I get that. But the bleachers piece of that, and the other start, the, the ionization and the HVAC, if we weren't coming out of a pandemic, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a strange, unfortunate time to be saying like, you know, and 98% is great, right? 99.9, .9. being where we are, that's a little harder to take at the moment. Normal times, we'd probably not think twice about it, right? Um, but I think the, the bleachers thing I would, I would push back and try to challenge us to try to find another way to keep that piece um, somehow. Yeah, and, and certainly that's something that we can look at. But again, like this, this is a, a definitive amount of money that we have to spend. So we'll, so you know, we, we the would fun, the fundraising so, thing. I was going to say the bleachers. Yes. Let's start with the bleachers on the fundraising. Then. <laughs> yes, we, we can. So I would agree that not having the whole school for assembly that impacts the education. I know. I mean, the so whole. Hold on, oh, hold sorry, on. Sorry. Ms. Larson, would you like to say well, something? Well, I was just going to say, well, then, like, why don't we create a committee to fundraise for that? Like, who's going to get on that? Who Are we going to ask Verve? To, does Verve want their name on it? Does Festival want their name on it? Like, what, you know what I mean? Who, what local business, what local business is? I mean, it's almost like the weight room in Oshkosh West. Like, we fundraised for that. We have all sorts of businesses who donated, families who donated, and they just have all their names. So do we, do we make it a project like that? Like, I think... Like if we're gonna, like if that's gonna happen realistically, right? It, it action has to be taken substantially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. I mean the. So I. I know that. Times are 
hard right now with inflation. And these are incredibly, um, I'm sure, difficult decisions to make. Um, but you know, the, the optics, I guess, we're building $50 million middle school, you know, in that ballpark where we're not going to be able to have one student assembly yeah. and we're sitting here talking about going to the community and asking to fundraise for bleachers. So, and again, we can, that's, you know, something that, that's something that we can look at. I think the, um, what it will always be put up against is what, what else, like what else gives, right? So, I mean, it, it's just, a, you know, it, thinking about as anybody's building a house these days or, or looking at any of that work. Um, so we'll, we'll have to go back and, and, you know, quantify that amount um, and be, be able to, uh, you know, take a look at that. And that's something we can do and, and be able to bring back. <laughs> Thank you. I would just like to suggest that, as a reminder, that our job is to define the what. So if we want bleachers restored, that's great. The how belongs to the administration. Mm -hmm. So the administration can come back with a recommendation, whether that's fundraising or tapping the fund balance or mm -hmm. tapping this year's potential uh, surplus budget yeah. surplus, but I don't think that's our job to do that this mm -hmm. evening. I but I think. So I think if we stay in our lane of defining what and let administration define the how, I think we can move this conversation along mm -hmm. and, and come back to this later. Yeah. Thank you. My takeaway from this presentation is the phrase lean and clean design. And I think that the taxpayers, you know, we are unfortunately working within a budget and we have, we are, the taxpayers paying for this school. So we must stay within a certain limit. And so, I appreciate the value engineering that you guys have done to keep us on track. I know that because there are things of the, the pandemic has raised ex construction costs. I feel very lucky that we're even be able to move forward with this project. So thank you for this lean and clean design. And I think the taxpayers will be grateful as well for being able to stay within budget, which we all want to go over budget, but we can't. So thank you. I have one other question, then you guys can move on to your next section of your presentation. Um, it's the actual last item on this slide that talks about revising the elevator type near the, near the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess I want to put that in a foundation of how does that affect, put that a different way, what is it specific, what type of elevator is it specifically and how would it, what's the intended use? So the, oh, go ahead. So there are two elevators <laughs> at Bell Phillips Middle School, um, given just the proximity and how the building laid out. Um, there is the uh, elevator that is on the north portion of the building, which is three stories tall. And once we get to three stories and the height that we are at, we have to go to what is called a traction style elevator. It does not have a pump or a, or a rod at the bottom of the pit that rises the car. It's on um, an electric belt of sort to raise it. And so anything you go into a building three stories or higher, that's a traction style elevator. Um, the other elevator that is over at the FIAD portion of the FIAD and music portion of the building is only a two stop elevator. So it only serves two floors. Um, at that point, we had the option to choose from an, a hydraulic style elevator, which is that, that rod that ra raises the shaft um, or the traction situation. Um, when originally designed, um, it was thought that, uh, you know, to keep consistency, both would be traction. That way, if there's one person coming to service the elevator, they could service both um, and, and no harm, no foul. Um, that we had the same system, two elevators, same system in the same building. Okay. Um, and Go ahead. in going through um, and looking at things, um, there is a substantial savings to go to the hydraulic system. And in talking with OASD, um, they have the hydraulic systems elsewhere in the district. So they felt comfortable stating that if there was service at, you know, Oaklawn, for example, they could hop down the street to Val Phillips to serve the hydraulic at, at Val Phillips and, and ha be okay with two separate systems in the same building. Um, so hopefully that. It, it does. And so just to, just to kind of go where I was going to go with it is that the revising of the elevator type here does not reduce accessibility to students or staff in any way. That's no. correct. It and maintains it as, as to what the, the code says that, that should be there. 
That's correct. And uh, elevators are vast different sizes. Um, this one can support a gurney in, in both locations. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for them? No? Proceed. Uh, moving forward, uh, what has occurred over the last 30 days from Myron? Uh, all topsoil has been removed from the job site. Uh, as you'll see in, in some of our photos, we're, we are uh, virtually completely graveled now. Uh, completion of water detention systems three and four, and we'll point those out in, in photos. Uh, those are the large underground cylindrical, uh, cylindrical tubes that we had talked about last week, the eight and a half foot diameter tubes. Continuation of stormwater catch basin installation. Uh, we talked about that a little bit at the last meeting. Again, those will follow the installation of the detention systems and that's kind of your, your uh, pathway for the water to flow underground into those detent systems. Uh, Myron has continued to excavate uh, for bioretention systems one and two. Those are going to be your above ground systems. We've got some photos to share with those. Uh, concrete footings continue uh, in sections C and A. They're now complete. C, remember, is your cafeteria. A is your northwest corner of your academic tower. Uh, following footings is your foundation walls, remembering that everything is flowing in a clockwise manner. So we've got our footings, foundation walls. Foundation walls are through C and um, into A. And then following your foundation walls is your CMU or your your block, your eight inch block that you would think of, concrete block. And that has begun on the south side of section C and you can see that rising above the ground now if you drive past that site. At the same time, uh, underground electrical work has begun. Uh, we do have a photo of that as well for the electrical rough ends where the transformer will sit and bring power into the new building. Dave, could we bother you? Dave, could you advance me? Thank you. So in the uh, three different colors you'll see are actually two colors, and, and um, the, the blue was, excuse me, I'll just move right into the pink. So where the pink is is the um, uh, footings. That is, again, the first pass. We started at the bottom. The footings moved from right to left, and then went north, and now they're over into the right-hand side of the top of the drawing. Following that in the blue is your foundation walls. They're all the way, uh, they again started at the bottom, right to left, then they went north, and they are currently at the top. So the bottom section is C, at the top where they stopped is section A, and that is your um, educational tower, three-story tower. And then the hashed uh, herringbone pattern on the bottom is where they've been working on the CMU block walls. And those block walls will then We'll talk about that. They'll transition now to that western exposure of the building, and that you'll start to see that wall begin to grow. We talked about uh, detention systems. This uh, last board meeting, they had just started this detent system number four. I had shared at that time that they were complete along Nevada Street and had just turned onto Kentucky. That system is complete along Kentucky Avenue and is buried and has gravel on top of it, compacted, ready to build. And they also comp completed detention system number three. As you will see, I, we do have some photographs that will show this particular system. It is fully um, buried underneath the parking lot. This particular system looks very much, as you'll see in photos, like the detention system number one that we had shown at our first board meeting where it's, it's kind of three fingers. Again, its, its purpose is to hold vast quantities of water and release them slowly into the city infrastructure. Also on the far right is bioretention system number one. Now that is going to be really basically they, they do the same thing as the underground detention system. It's just an above ground system. Uh, it will receive water from the parking lot. It will hold water and it will release water more slowly uh, into the uh, city stormwater system. Also, uh, last week, uh, Myron and Soper uh, completed the excavation for bioretention system number two. So both of them uh, both serve the parking lot. They both serve the same function. They will take uh, the water runoff, stormwater runoff from that parking lot. They will hold the water 
and they will release it into the city. The only difference is these are above ground, they're exposed, more like a, kind of like a pond, uh, but they don't hold water. They will hold it sh for a short period of time and release it into that system. So we have some pictures to share with you. Um, top left is part of that uh, detention system number four we had talked briefly about. This is actually looking from Nevada Street, looking south along Kentucky Avenue. Um, it's a very long, <coughs> long piece of that detention system number four before they fill that in. Uh, moving to the top right is really just, um, it's a picture of nothing, uh, but yet it says something. So it's really, it's all the excavation, all the soil has been removed, the site has been graveled, it's flat, that is where the school is going to sit. Uh, the walls are, are kind of starting behind the, the truck off, the red truck off to your left. So in the future, you know, this is probably one of the last pictures you'll see of, of really nothing, so to speak. Uh, on the bottom left are your footings. Uh, we had talked about the first thing that happens as we move around the building is the footings get poured and then um, your wall and then ultimately um, the block. So this is a picture of the footings that will support the rest of the wall. The bottom right is a picture of the eight inch block. This happens to be block on the western exposure of um, the academic tower. <coughs> So we showed you the footings. Um, we on the top left is the poured concrete wall that will support the eight-inch block. Uh, a couple different photos of that particular block wall. This uh, this wall is of just two different angles. It's the same wall. It is the western exposure for section C, which again is a cafeteria, boiler room, steam stem, moving into A, uh, upper left. Um, is actually part of uh, moving from C into A. Um, moving into the middle is the section of C. There you can see the piping that is part of your infrastructure. It will support your electrical going into the boiler room. You can see a lot of your vent piping and stacks as that boiler room starts to transition into steam stem. Um, bottom middle is, um, now you can see that the footings and, and the uh, structural wall are fully buried and they're ready to support the eight inch CMU, which you can see on the lower left. Um, you can start to see that eight inch block with Mason's, or Myron's Mason team now um, is, is added. Um, that wall now is probably up to about what, nine feet, 10 feet. Um, uh, yeah, probably 10 to 12 feet would be my guess. On your far right is retention system number one. Uh, I had showed you that highlighted in yellow that th that is fully excavated. Of course, you have a lot of finish work to do to it, but that is at its excavation depth along uh, Kentucky Avenue. So here, uh, last set of pictures. Uh, this is uh, the retention system. This is number three. I had explained to you that is fully buried underneath the parking lot. Um, this, is, this is pictures before they, they fully bury it in gravel. As you can see, it's very similar to the one that we had talked about last week where it is, it's got a headpiece and it's got three separate fingers, if you will, that will extend across the length of the parking lot. And then they cap the ends. The whole system is designed to hold water from the parking lot. Ultimately, uh, they, they tie that into um, Kentucky Avenue and um, it drains into the city stormwater system. On the bottom right, you can see the, uh, the bulldozer and the excavator working on retention system number two. Um, again, that is, in essence, um, you would look at it and call it an open pond. It's, it's going to, um, it'll, it'll receive water from the parking lot, but unlike our detention system being fully buried, this one will be open. It will receive water and it will drain off the same way. I think if you could put that last picture up, please. Sure. Um, to note uh, the picture up in the right, in the right hand corner, mm -hmm. just to kind of for us to know it and for the community to know it, that there's a person right. in that in that picture, and you can see to scale the size of those mm -hmm. of those tubes that, that they're putting in, in the ground. And those tubes um, are eight and a half feet in diameter. Yeah. And we've been asked a lot about this, you know, what what we're doing here, and I think that kind of shows a little bit more of the size and the expansiveness of that of that retention project that. That we've created so thank you for for that for, for putting that back up 
And if you don't mind if I add to this, you know, typically we, we like to do the above grade um, retention systems as they're a bit more cost effective. Um, but being as landlocked and as tight as we are on this site and given that it was a green space and we put a lot of impervious surface on, on this property, you know, we, had, we really had no choice but to put it underground. So um, again, trying to stay lean and clean on this project, but um, there are some things that we, we had to do and this is one of those things. Thank you for that. So for the next 30 days, what can we expect to see? Um, we had just shown you the excavation of the bioretention basins one and two. Uh, Myron will add drain tile, they'll add a liner. Uh, those basins will start to take shape. Um, underground storm sewer sanitary lines, again, uh, storm lines, excuse me, are following the building footprint. So uh, the next couple bullet points are, we're gonna revisit this for the next several months as they work their way around the building, but we're gonna have footings continued to be excavated and installed. They're gonna finish area B, which is the northeast corner of the academic tower, and they're gonna move into D, which is really the exterior wall of our administration portion of Val Phillips. Uh, that will be followed by our concrete foundation walls in sections A and B, which is your academic tower. And then that will be followed by the load-bearing block walls, the eight-inch block walls that you saw a picture of. So they will be, one will lead, second and third. They'll just keep ch chasing each other around the building. Um, we will see in the coming weeks installation of the concrete footings, foundation walls, and block walls for the learning stairs, which are placed um, in the, excuse me, you'll see those grow out of the middle of the cafeteria. If you recall, the learning stairs move from the middle of the cafeteria in section C to the second floor by the library and they're, they sit very proud in the middle of the cafeteria. They're kind of the, the emphasis or, uh, of that entire cafeteria. Uh, so we'll start to see uh, those block walls start to grow out of the ground in the coming weeks. Electrical will begin installation of conduit in the exterior masonry walls. Um, as those walls begin to grow, you will also see um, the electrical in the parking lot now that the uh, detention system is, is fully installed, uh, the soils are out, the gravel will be, um, they'll finish adding gravel to that area, compacting it, now the electrical will take over, pole bases, concrete will be poured, electrical will be added to those pole bases to support parking lot lights, ultimately a parking lot in the very near future. Any questions on where we're at with Myron and construction? Just have one. Sure. Very exciting. It's great to see so much happening. Mm -hmm. At one point we had talked about a time lapse, lapse camera. Did that ever oh. happen? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Actually, as a matter of fact, this morning um, it, it did happen and technology fired that camera up this morning. Great. So we were able to order it. We ran the wiring. We built the stand. Um, actually, the That's first awesome. camera uh, had some issues. We got, a, we got a second camera, but it is as of today, it is taking pictures. That'll be exciting for the community. Thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you for asking. Uh, the last item we'd like to discuss tonight or share with you is the uh, existing Merrill site redevelopment concept. So Nate. Yes, thank you. Um, so obviously a, a bit of a, um, a sweet but yet sour uh, topic um, dealing with the existing Merrill site. Um, as you know, the Val Phillips project is being built on the grass space that supported the current Merrill building. Um, the you know the board and and the district had you know not committed one way or the other to necessarily what to do with this site, and I think we're getting closer to to what that may look like. Um, so uh, something that was asked of us to study would be of, of how c we can best utilize um, that, that current mural site um, in the event that it's grass um, or, or space for students at Bell Phillips or students in the community or even community members to use that as a green space as, as we took away a large swath of green space um, in building Bell Phillips. Um, so uh, on this drawing, you'll see that this is um, actually turned uh, 90 degrees to the left. So north is to your left in this photo. The street on the bottom is uh, Jackson uh, Street, sorry, I'm sorry, Kentucky Street. Um, and New York is on your right. Um, the kind of blue outline that you see in the background is the current um, Merrill building shape. Um, obviously you can see it takes up a large portion of that site. Um, after, after working through with um, your athletic directors, 
um, with, with Cable over at Park and Rec, um, with, with the building principal and with district um, administration. It was identified that um, this space really could um, use a, be used as a uh, soccer slash football field. Um, have some, some, which is centered in the middle of, of a proposed uh, track. Uh, three basketball courts uh, to the north side of that site, which would be immediately across the street um, from the Val Phillips site. Um, further to the left, bottom left-hand corner, um, we are proposing a, a swing set um, in, in that area, um, which is that kind of horizontal lines with, you kind of see the swings going in opposite directions. Um, again, to s help more support uh, that middle school project. Um, we also are um, trying to really, you know, we, we heard a lot of things about how at um, the current Webster Stanley site and the current Merrill site, how, you know, track and field is practicing in parking lots and, and how, um, how can we best get them out of those areas and into something a little bit more suitable. Also with, with the challenge of, uh, of, you know, the conflicts of hosting events for middle school level um, and how that interrupts high school practice or, or high school events. Um, so it really started down um, the soccer football field piece on the center and, and it grew into a little bit more of a track and field um, need. Um, at this point we are showing um, a full, I believe that is a eight or, I'm sorry, I think that is an eight lane track um, with, uh, with the 100 meter down at the bottom of this plan. Mm -hmm. um, at the top, you'll see that there's a rectangle that um, identifies high and long jump, long jump um, up at the top as a possibility. Um, and then uh, discus and shot um, being able to use in the upper left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. So really trying to help facilitate um, some of the middle school track needs at this site. Um, there is a space just south of the discus um, spot for a, a storage shed as the track and field um, equipment is, is quite large and, and needs a place to live um, that would be proposed in that location. Um, and trying to figure, figure out some of the moving pieces here, but this could be designed as a total grass space and graded and stormwater appropriate for a track to be installed right away or installed in the future. The track surface is the, the, most, cost, um, the most cost into this project. Um, as a, to get the base layer and the asphalt and, and the material for the track itself is, would be the most expensive part of this project. Um, but ultimately in going through those conversations with ADs, um, Park and Rec, District Administration, and the building principal, um, Principal Levy, uh, this was the ideal design in, in talking with them. Um, and now it's just a, a matter of, of navigating if, if this is what the school district um, desires long term. I think there is uh, just a notation of, um, you know, track needs throughout the district and, and we'll probably hear that in the FAC um, conversations um, in June. Any questions, sir? Is there an opportunity f to have a football field in the middle like, at, like, like we see at West High School? Yep, so it's a little hard to tell. There's a lot okay. of stuff going on here. Um, but in the middle, that is a full-size soccer field and a full-size football okay. field in the middle. Okay. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention, you know, we, we obviously heard a lot of um, kind of heartache associated to a lot of the trees being removed at the Val Phillips site. Um, there would be a large opportunity to leave a lot of existing trees on this site. So that, that is a perk um, in what would be the heartache of losing the building in the community but still being able to save a lot of those large uh, trees that live there. Specifically along um, New York and then kind of in that northeast corner. Um, unfortunately, the ones in the southeast corner could be problematic, but we'll, we'll have to work through that. There's, there's one tree that I, I hope we pay special attention to. It's outside of the current playground, correct? No, it's outside no. of the, the uh, current entrance to Merrill Middle School. Oh. It's a tree that was, a li was planted in memory of a child who uh, attended that school and had passed away. And so I'm hoping that we can preserve that tree or successfully move it we, so uh, that we don't lose it. There's a, there's a stone plaque um, or marker in front of that tree and I, I really think we should do our best to try to preserve that <coughs> in honor of that child and her family. Yeah, I, I agree. I had shared um, I'm very familiar with that tree and that plaque. 
Um, I, it resides, it's up in the upper right hand corner. Mm -hmm. uh, it will not be in the way of construction. Good. Thank you. Any I like, I'm you know, I like the concept. Um, bigger picture, bigger scale. You know, this, I watched the last facilities 2.0 meeting and it sounds like there's still a lot of discussion and things are still being worked through. So it'll be interesting to see how this <coughs> fits with that, with what those recommendations bring. Um, Cause you know, this is great. The whole picture, you know, the big picture is um, something we got to put together. You know, so I'm interesting to see if this fits with what big picture, you know, the, comes out of that committee. So, but I like this concept. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think I'm going to start off easy and go with. Um, one question in regards to the vastness of this site. Um, I spend a lot of time going to track meets at North right now because that's where my middle schooler does track, is at North. So I completely understand the rationale for, for this. Um, they have a concession stand at the high school. So with the amount of families and people that we're gonna be bringing to a site like this is, is a concession stand kind of built into this format. Uh, currently, there is not, but that could be considered. Okay. Yeah. I think we might. I mean, we might want to consider something like that. So, um, if we go with that, so um, this will be probably my first time kind of publicly stating that, um, as much as I understand the vastness of this plan, um, I am in support of a more modified athletic field than what um, is being proposed here on the premise um, that uh, there is um, the historical significance of the historic nature of the former middle school could be maintained and be reused for something else. So I think I'm probably speaking for myself here at this point, um, but um, I guess my question is what um, what consideration was had have 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 we gone through to consider the idea of retaining historical elements of Merrill Middle School and still providing an avenue for those recreational or um, athletic options that were that we're trying to do? Yes. Um, so uh, this has um, been brought up, and if. If you know the history of this this building, this um, Merrill Middle School Elementary School has been tacked onto um, two, three, four times, something like that. Um, the challenge is, is ev even if you uh, removed those additions, uh, there would still be uh, portions that would have to be fixed, altered, whatever it may be, and, and maybe that's okay. Um, but unfortunately, I um, to put it bluntly, they don't build them like they used to. Um, so uh, we can we can tear down the old and we can patch in where that that attachment was made, um, but the historical nature would not be re uh, reflected well um, there without significant significant cost. Um, as far as uh, what that means for the athletic side of things, um, I do not believe what well, you could not get a full size track on the site um, I, and you would have to probably go with some sort of like 60 yard configuration for football or soccer um, as as it would be um, a bit challenging to rotate it in the other direction and still get all of our um, all of our clearances that the city requires um, just uh, another piece that we would have to be considered is that if uh, the existing building was modified where the additions were torn down, the historic was was um, was left in place and you sold it to somebody and they made it into, I don't know, multi-use living, right? Um, the city would require on-site parking for that and that would further eat into this site. Um, so it, it, I'm not saying it can't be done because anything can be done, um, but it, it would I would say you would lose half of the site. Sure. So, um, and I'm not prepared to try to sway the board in any which direction on that. I just feel that um, 
that conversation of the historical significance and whether it could be saved or not or whether that's of the interest of the district um, is probably a conversation that many of us have been engaged in in our community and to not talk about it and to not put it out there um, I think is disingenuous to to our community as well it's just as important as a full athletic field uh, in regard to that conversation so um, so and I know that um, you know I, I understand where you're where you're going from in regards to that you know my thought the best use is to sell off the historical part and let someone else determine what that would be used for we wouldn't spend any money patching up the building or doing any of that stuff uh, because that would be you know the the new owner's responsibility I understand the need for modifying its use and that it still eats up what we uh, believe is our best use for that property so the question that I don't that I'm not sure that we've all had either publicly is is that what we want for that site you know um, you've put up this here um, and I know that's gone through the facilities Fin facilities and finance committee but I know that we as a board haven't talked about the full-on use of what we want this site to be like so um, it's being proposed without there being uh, an alternative to that so um, and I think that's an important conversation for the board to have as well so um, I think I maybe have created an opportunity for people to ask questions or to converse now I was going to ask when you want to have that conversation. Are we so, ready to have it right now? Is that something you want to put on a future agenda item? Um, well, I think it's it's best to have that. I, I think it's best to have that conversation in a balanced way. Um, you know, uh, for uh, you know potentially us to make a decision on what that direction is by to having what it might look like in two different ways, um, and then us kind of deciding what direction that might look like. That's, that's my, my thought. Other than what I see now is that this is going to come to us. This is what's going to be proposed to us. Um, you know, and, and again, uh, and, and, to be, and to be respectful, I may be out of my lane on this. I don't, know that, I don't know that I am. I know that I'm trying to be above the line in regards to having a discussion about what this direction might be. So with the fully understanding that in the end I might actually vote for this proposal too so um, so, um, so we got multiple people okay. so uh, stuff do you want can we come back or do you want to finish um, is there more no I might be saying the same okay. thing Stephanie well, so, so Miss Carlin and then Miss Wyman my question to you then Bob is what would you like to see up there as an alternative because you were talking about sure. you'd like to have a choice so what what Yes. What, what do you envision as a choice? So what I've, what I would envision is, um, and again, it's hypothetical because of some of the reasons that you're suggesting here, is that we would save all of the very historical stuff and anything that's been built in the last 50 years would of disappear the of the building. Okay. Would disappear, um, and what that does is that puts us at about three quarters, just just under, no not three quarters, I would say about two thirds to the north could be used um, in a different orientation, could be used for athletic fields, and then that would save um, a third of the property for historical and potentially parking. Again, it's hypothetical because parking is much more of an animal than just saying there'll be enough for, for parking there. So. Um, Hypothetically, that's that's what um, that's what I could what I would suggest. And so, the structure in your idea, your conception, would be used for like what we did at Smith, or okay. um, like it would provide the district to do something similar to to Smith. Okay. Um, uh, it could. I, I mean, it provides that option. So, okay. that's one. 
when I'm looking at it, I have a few different thoughts, but we always say students first. I'd like to see what facilities comes back with the planning committee to s and, and evaluate then what do we have, do we have enough spaces like this? Uh, is this going to be integral in uh, the future of our students? Personally, I'd rather have the services for our students of today as much as I like the past than protecting the past. I think having the facilities for our students for the next 50 years is very important and if this is a piece of it, then it's certainly something we need to consider. But I'd like to see the overall package before we vote on one plot of land. And that's something we'd be able to provide yeah. in June as part of that FAC report. Oh, okay. Yeah, the 2.0, 2 I think, their recommendations is going to be vital towards the big picture. I mean, there are some things we do know. You know, I mean, we do know we have <coughs> inadequate facilities for a lot of different things. I mean, we have kids uh, practicing track and parking lots on both sides of town without batons. I mean, I have my own daughter coming home and trying to practice the hurdle by, hurdles by jumping over boxes for her middle school track meet because they don't have hurdles to practice at, at Traeger. You know, so we have issues. Um, or needs, I should say, that we need to address. And um, that information should be provided to us, I think, shortly. And then we need to see how it all fits. But, you know, most definitely um, we need to ensure that, you know, students are first and that our plan is going to adequately meet. Uh, all of our students needs so I think it's premature to make decisions um, because on one piece of a pie that's going to be a really big pie that we got to decipher through in a little while um, so that's my thought process so I sure. guess I agree with Beth and, I, and I'm not going to disagree with anything that that you all are saying it, it all is relevant um, it's just that I come back to that the referendum question that was on there and it, it <coughs> talked about um, you know whether or not to tear down that that piece of property that was part of the question and so in, in that it brings me back not only just the students but also back to the community that you know voted almost 60 percent in favor of, of building the facility and so my intention here is not to sway you guys into creating a different proposal or suggesting that but is to have that conversation that acknowledges um, a broader sense of connection to that property that's not just just students it's also related to the community which we're already doing right we're, we're creating Bell Phillips Middle School with that and so that's that stronger connection um, it's just that I think we also when the intention of changing that question on the referendum, the intention was around the historical nature of the property. So um, that's all I'm doing, is I'm, I'm having that conversation related to, to knowing the context of, of how that question got to be the way that it was, and then how it was, how it was passed. So, um, Dr. Herzog and then Ms. Salaji. I have serious concerns about maintaining a living <laughs> structure on that site. We're going to be constructing an 850 student middle school. And those kids need space to run around and to have phi ed classes and to have opportunities for green space in that neighborhood. Um, so I have serious concerns about maintaining any part of the uh, Merrill building. Um, you had said you thought you were out of your lane. I would have to agree with you. I mean, your, your background is housing and you're talking about preserving this for housing reasons. I have serious concerns about that. And we talk about students first 
and I think that's where our emphasis has to be. I understand historic preservation. I've had long talks with Shirley Maddox. Um, I'm a history mi minor from college. I get that, but um, the optics of your being involved with developers talking about this space is very concerning to me and what that does to this the reputation of this board. I'm sorry I have to say that. That's fine. I, I would disagree with you. I would say that I don't have strong relationships with developers about it. I've been approached by several community members about about that. So yes, I do have a 10 year history of working in the housing field. Yes, but um, but that's not does not mean that I have an inappropriate relationship with developers. Well, I do know you've so. told me you met on two occasions with developers. The board did not authorize you to do that. And I did not meet with any developers. <laughs> That's I, do I have conversations? Yes, do people approach me about that, but I am not specifically meeting I'm not about this site. About that. So. I know what you told me. Thank you. So I was going to say, but I, this is what I thought Ms. Carlin might get at. As we campaign, I don't know about you, but I did get questions about this. I don't know. I don't know who developers are in this town, so I don't know if they were from developers or just community members. Um, so I would agree. It's nice to have this conversation for the public to see where we all stand. I do think that that's important, and that's why I asked at the beginning, "Are we ready to have it now?" Because I also have a lot of. Well, I mean, I went on record when I was asked by people how I felt about it that I do not support the plan to preserve the historic nature of Merrill. Um, I like to think that I'm open-minded and willing to change my mind, but I just kind of to let you know that would be a hard sell for me because with almost 900 students on the site, I just think of how important it will be for them to have, even if you know the facilities 2.0 committee doesn't say we need a track field here, even just to have green space like they do out, say, at Traeger, where there's a a lot of open space, especially in a more urban site. I just feel like that is much more important to our students' mental health, physical health, and just overall well-being, behavioral problems. Um, that's a lot more important to me than the history of the site. Um, I also wanted to point out that the referendum question, I pulled it up as you were talking about, that the referendum question was changed. It was never actually changed it was just developed specifically to not say what we were going to do like so i'll read the language right from it it says um to build a new middle school and a new elementary school closing three aging outdated facilities all we were specific about is saying not naming certain schools that were going to sure. be closed or torn down that was all laid out in the long-range facilities plan so it's not like we were hiding it from the public I remember those conversations as being our goal was just to be as kind of open with what we were asking the public to support as possible. I'm not remembering it the same way as you are about there being wording to, I, mean, I can't remember now what it was you said, sure. that was like 10 minutes ago. Um, but the, the wording around the, the referendum, I just wanted to make sure that we were clear that we didn't ever address this at all in the referendum. I guess that's kind of yeah. the point I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. And so I did pull it up to make sure I was remembering it right. And there's just, there's nothing in there at all about naming specific schools. Um, just that it would be a new middle school, a new elementary school, and then closing three facilities. That the result would be consolidated and modern <coughs> schools that are more efficient, effective, and equitable with fewer school buildings to maximize use and efficiency. Like it was pretty open-ended language. Sure. Mr. Carnes and Ms. Carl. I think what makes us strong as a board is having people that come from different backgrounds. So the fact that, you know, housing is something that you came from and, and was an idea you, you know, thought we could explore, I think is something that we should explore. I think that's something that, you know, not saying that's where you're, where you came from, but I agree, I heard people talking about that in the community, and, and honestly, it may have just be a coincidence for what you have done and, and do and, and what this is, but regardless of any of that, I think it's fair to have the conversation. And so, but I also, 
think that maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I mean, knowing that we're going to have this conversation, I think, is just the important thing. And what Mr. Wright and Ms. Wyman have said earlier, we will have that conversation, but we need to have it once we have all the information from the Facilities Advisory Committee. And then we can really sit here and, and dig into where we're going with it. So I think it's completely valid to have that conversation, but we're just, we're having that conversation without having Mm -hmm. a ton, I mean any information so I just think we're maybe spinning our wheels at this point but I think it's something that we should definitely come back to Ms. Carlin um, I don't really have much more to add uh, Mr. Carnes um, basically took the words out of my mouth I also appreciate the conversation and I asked your vision and follow up on it because I, I honestly had no idea what you we would possibly envision and as Ms. Salaji said it, it would also be a tough sell for me to um, find a way to keep any of, of that building and I understand the historical it's you know it's we bought we it's hard it's hard to, to say goodbye to a building but um, you know I, I agree with this space has got to be what is best for students and the 850 students that are going to be attending that middle school so it, it, I appreciate the conversation, but I also, on the other hand, feel like it might be below the line, but I think it also comes back to communication. This is kind of, I don't know if it's because I'm not on facilities or finance, but this is the first time that I ever saw anything about this space. So um, I don't know. So we're, we're, we're having this conversation on live TV because we can't talk about it on other. <laughs> You know, we can't talk about it unless we're publicly known to talk about. It. So I do appreciate the conversation, but I don't do not believe it's a decision for our, our board to be making. The, um, you know, what as Dr. Herzog said, we are oversee the operations and the details and the daily go to Dr. Davis. So I look forward to seeing what comes through as the proposal and the recommendation. This is just a rough draft, as I understand it. But then <coughs> maybe going forward. Um, you know, making sure that the board stays up to date on what's happening so that you know, we're not having these awkward conversations of different viewpoints and whatnot on live TV would be a suggestion I have. Thank you. All right. Is there anything more that you gentlemen would like to add? Uh, I, there was one piece that I just wanted to mention. Um, there was a very specific design intent of safely crossing students from the Bell Phillips mm -hmm. site to something over here. Mm -hmm. um, as, as I think some of the uh, early FAC work identified this space as some sort of green space. Now, quantity of green space is obviously to be determined, but I did want to mention that there is, uh, and worked out and approved by the city, a very a conscious way of, of crossing students across a, across uh, Kentucky. So just wanted to note that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Next up <coughs> is the instructional materials and student fee schedule for 22-23. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Yeah, Gunlock uh, <laughs> providing that for us. Hello, everybody. No slides, just me. Uh, we bring forward the instructional material fee schedule every year, and uh, I honestly never thought we would be this close to doing something that we talked about three or four years ago. If you'll remember, we were sort of the state champs of, of instructional material fees. There was almost nothing you could do in our schools that didn't have some sort of a little fee attached to it. And we had some serious issues with that probably five or six years ago. And we've been taking methodical steps every year in stripping down those fees and removing them. Part of the reason that we did that is we found that there, these fees were becoming barriers to kids taking certain courses. And, and the board uh, seemed to be very concerned about that, and, we've, and as so were we. Um, we are making a couple of minor tweaks. The, the fee schedule has gotten very, very simple over time. Uh, we've shrunk this down to much fewer fees than we used to have, which is great. Uh, the big change right now is uh, the elimination of music fees, including the instrument fee, the solo and ensemble fees, and the uniform maintenance fees. That was something that was brought up when we made the tweaks last year by some of the principals, but we thought, you know, sort of taking step by step, we wanted to see each time we do this if there's a major fiscal issue with it. So far, there has not been. 
Um, we are looking at an increase in the driver education fee, which would go from 325 to 375. That is simply um, more of a cost recovery. That was something that was uh, put forward by the uh, uh, business office in terms of matching what the costs of that program currently are. Um, and as far as the rationale, uh, equity in terms of the fees assessed and collected for music, so they would not become a barrier to any student wishing to participate in that program. Yes, um, co obviously, competition for students via open enrollment and positive customer service. And lastly, the increased revenue necessary for driver's education to offset the costs. So um, it's the fee schedule is there, and you can see the items highlighted in yellow would be the, the main uh, changes that we have going forward. Any qu I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Um, I really like what you're doing with the music fees, especially because, um, you know, it is an equity issue. Like, we need to have, you know, we need to make things so they're accessible to students and so that the cost doesn't make it something they can't participate in. Mm -hmm. So I really like any time we have an opportunity to lower fees so that more kids have access to this type of programming that we provide in the school district. Um, I, I really like that. So I was going to ask a question about the instrument fee. So I'm new to this. I haven't had a child in middle school or higher, but um, my understanding is that the school district has some of the instruments, so I'm, my understanding of this is if you eliminate the instrument fee, students will no longer be paying like a rental fee to the school Correct. district Correct. to play an instrument. Yep. We do not have all of the instruments though. I so believe that is correct So some students will still have to pay a rental fee, they'll just pay it to an outside organization. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not sure, since we don't assess that fee, I'm not sure there's any way to, right? to get around that I think situation. the only way to get around it would be to have us provide all of the instruments that right. we offer right. students to learn. Right. Because that does create an equity issue and that <laughs> for students who get assigned an instrument that we own, yep. there's no fee. For students who get assigned an instrument that we do not own, yeah. they're going to pay a fee. Yeah. Some, some of the instruments that people select are more rare and therefore we don't keep those in our inventory or popular like or saxophones popular. right are always out mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yep saxophone was had that situation as well it sounds right. like an opportunity right to, right it's a stepping <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction right. to get where we can be completely equitable it is right. yeah but I just didn't know if I understood that all completely so I just no. wanted to make sure that was yeah and it, it, it is expensive hold on one second okay. sorry, sorry. miss Larson miss Herzog and then miss Carlin I was going to ask a question about something a little different, but is, I'm not sure, so is driver's ed free for students who qualify for free or reduced lunch? No. Or no. Has the board considered making that an option? For uh, not in the past, no. Okay. Largely because driver's ed is not a required course, it's, yeah. it's something that's more optional. Um, typically what the district has done is also considered not offering driver's ed in the past. Uh, you, you know, and as far as it's not something we have to offer, but, it, but we've never gone down that road as of yet. Um, and the fact that, uh, well, like I said, it's, it's not a required course, it's an optional that kids would take. Dr. Rizzo. Thank you. I'm really glad to see these reductions in fees under <laughs> a tradition, if not law, we are supposed to be providing a free and public education known as an FAPE. And this, I believe, brings us more in line with that concept. Um, one question I do have uh, regards field trips. I was recently with some adult women who re were recalling their field trip experiences from the Oshkosh Area School District probably going back a couple of decades. Um, they noted that they could not afford field trips. And so they, they would absent themselves on those days. Oh, wow. They would stay home because it was easier to say that I was sick than I couldn't afford to go on a field trip. So I'm curious if that sort of practice is still with us or do we provide for students 
go to, for example, to the Oshkosh Public Museum or the EAA or local places uh, who otherwise couldn't afford those opportunities. Um, we absolutely do not deny any child to go on a field trip because okay. of their ability to offset the cost or the admission cost or the transportation cost. So that's number one. There are field trips that are aligned to our curriculum at different grade levels, and we budget for that um, within the curriculum budget um, for the field trips, for the transportation. Um, we partner to either offset the admission cost or have no admission cost. Um, there's also we partner with the schools or our partners at learning like businesses to help us offset that as well but no child is denied going on a field trip because of any type of ability to pay for fees thank you i really appreciate yes our looking out for all of our students mm -hmm. putting students first yes. thank you um, i know miss carlin i think you're up next sure uh, to Ms. Larson's point, I had actually made an inquiry about um, driver's ed for students that can't afford it because even though it's not a required course, you do need, um, in order to get any kind of car insurance, if you don't have driver's ed, you pay a much higher premium. But and I think at the time, Ms. Conrad said that you there are ways that we work with students to help them get driver's ed if they can't afford it. Correct. We connect students and families with resources within our community to do that. Keep in mind that driver's education is not a credit-bearing course. When we say that it's not required or even optional, it's not even a credit-bearing course mm -hmm. that we have there. But we absolutely work um, with families and students to connect them with resources in the community to be able to offset that. Um, one thing is, is that when we offer it at school, it is at a lower rate than if you went out um, mm -hmm. and purchase that from a, a private like cruising safely or something got it. Right. Yeah. and even with this increase it's still going to be at a much it's lower still a, it's, it's still, still a lot lower, lower than yeah. yeah correct mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm. oh, thank you I was just going to speak a little bit to Dr. Herzog's question and let her know that at least from my experience as a parent whenever my kids are sent home with the field trip form there's always an email from the teacher saying if this fee is not part of your family budget reach out and yeah. like I don't know what every school does but a, for yeah. example the PTOs are like Ms. Conrad right. said the Correct. business and partnerships through the PALS program yeah. I know mm -hmm. that most schools find a way to let students know when they get that form yeah. sent home we always find a way yeah so yeah. And it was part of a PTO budget at Lakeside too yeah we would mm -hmm. say that we would set aside money budgeted Correct. money for kids that couldn't afford field trips sure. and it was always available yeah. Thank you. Good to know. And I actually had just a comment. My comment was going to be how do we know that that child needs that type of assistance or, or help? That answer is one way. I don't know that that's consistent across the board. Right. Um, because I, I know that I don't, I don't receive that email from you know, my, my kids' teachers in, in regards to, or, or in the past. Um, so you know the, the question comes back how do we how do we know that and how do we engage that in a way that is um, easy for them to do that without bringing you know added stigma to ha needing that assistance right so um, different schools approach it in different ways and relationships matter when it comes to sure. those pieces um, it's not always just free and reduced lunch would be an indicator because at different times or whatever there could be does it fit or does it not fit so number one it comes back to relationships and number two like our instructions have been that like we are not denying any child to go on a field trip and we find a way to we find a way to make it work sure I think that's good I know that when those slips come home to our house mm -hmm. and there is a fee on it we always send a couple extra dollars because we know mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. uh, there are there are children Correct. out there that that have that challenge, and and we're yep. able to do a little bit extra to help out those. Yep. So, um, but I think you're right. It's it's relationships mm -hmm. that matter. So. Correct. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? <coughs> no. Okay. See none. Thank you. We're up next. Too. All right. Next up yes. is the uh, extended contract. Oh, yes. um, so. Uh, Julie and Dave can stay. I have uh, more friends joining me. Uh, uh, Kim and Matt and Linda. Yeah, I was going to say. So. 
So we have a, every year we bring uh, any extended contracts. These are for people who are under a normal teaching contract who are going to be working outside the uh, specified school year. Um, all of us have different people in different spots who would take advantage of some of these contracts. The two that uh, I'm responsible for are for the technology integration coaches and for the media specialists. The media specialists and the media paraprofessionals are the ones who uh, largely manage our 9,000 Chromebook fleet when it comes back in at the end of the year. Uh, one thing that I'm very pleased to report that we have done is we keep those Chromebooks in the hands of kids as long as possible now. Uh, we used to, with the first year, we, were, we looked at collecting them weeks ahead of when school would stop, and we got a lot of feedback from teachers that, hey, we're using these, students are using these, you need to have them in their hands. So what we've done is we've put together an extended contract plan that handles the management of those devices. And it is not just a collection, it is, it, there's a whole list of things that they do with those devices to make sure they're inventoried properly, they're reset properly, they're ready to go for the kids the following following fall. Obviously summer school plays into that as well. So that's on the media side of it. On the technology integration coach side, uh, th you'll notice you did not see anything for extended contracts the past few years. This is one of those years where we're going to be handing out staff Chromebooks and board member Chromebooks uh, coming this uh, fall. And they are preparing for some pretty uh, awesome professional development for our staff. This is sort of our one shot to re reset our staff in terms of a lot of the program services and uh, software that we provide to them on an ongoing basis. So a big portion of what's going to happen this summer is they're building a whole institute for our elementary and secondary professional staff. Um, so that's that's for those two groups, and I'll turn it over to the rest of you to discuss you to your various you wanna, groups. Do you want to come? Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Kim. You go. Are you going to come up? Yeah. All right, there you go. Um, the next group is under Kim and I, under curriculum instruction and assessment, and that would be our um, curriculum quarter. That would be our coordinators and. Um, sometimes we feel like it's pretty obvious what our coordinators are doing in the summer as far as professional development and prepping um, to get ready for the school year. Um, one, on, one thing on there that's not, um, doesn't come up very often, we don't talk about it often, is our agriculture teachers under different pieces are running the greenhouse um, and other pieces during the summer that don't come under a normal teaching contract. I think another piece that is newer for um, this year is um, we are updating our portal pages, which is the internal piece with PD and with other pieces, and so they'll be working on some of the inside work. So, mm -hmm. good. Yes. Start. I can. Sure. So yeah, I'm here, um, the special education um, coordinators as well as the transition people. So our transition people will be busy working on that food truck um, and doing indicator 14 surveys, which is the revenue source for this. Mary Beth Connors calls um, all graduates to make sure that they are doing something productive after high school and that becomes a um, revenue generator for us. But more importantly, our special ed coordinators uh, <laughs> prepare for the start of the school year with meaningful staff development for special ed teachers, coordinating with the curriculum department, making sure we're having rigor, and just preparing for all new staff onboarding, compliance issues, and just IEP timelines. <clears throat> so my portion of the report includes our sc high school counselors, the alternative education coordinator, uh, slash <clears throat> Riverside supervisor, slash e academy coordinator, and our uh, SEL coordinator and our SEL technical support specialist. So, <clears throat> in terms of our high school counselors, there's quite a bit that they do over summer. We always have students moving into the district, moving out of the district. Um, students right up until the last day of school either earning credits or not earning credits. So really, a lot of what they're doing is making sure kids are scheduled in the appropriate summer classes and earning the credits that they're going to you know, eventually need to have in order to graduate. So that's just one smart, small part of of what they do over summer. There's a lot of prep work that takes place to get ready for the start of the next school year too. A lot of that is evaluating summer credits that are earned by students. And again, making sure they're scheduled for appropriate uh, courses come fall. Um, in terms of our alternative education coordinator and Riverside coordinator, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure Riverside is ready to go. Uh, there's a lot of work that happens on the E-Academy end of things as well. Um, <coughs> Uh, and 
other than that, I, I know she does a lot with um, making sure that um, the requirements for the, the GED program that's associated with Riverside, uh, it's a partnership with Fox Valley, is set as well. And then our SEL coordinator and our SEL technical support folks also do a lot to make sure we're set to start the year with PBIS, uh, making sure it's integrated properly with conscious discipline and that teachers have what they need to start out on day one and make sure that our students' social emotional learning needs are met. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you all. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is the 22-23 Riverside contract. Director Cameron. Yeah, so the Riverside program has traditionally been probably our most popular alternative education option at the high school level. Uh, we, we run the program in conjunction with Fox Valley Technical College. It's on site at FBTC, so it's an adult learning environment, which is appealing for a lot of our students. Uh, the students who technically enroll in Riverside are, are those that really haven't been all that successful in a regular school setting, may possibly be credit deficient, and just need a different pathway to graduation. So that's what Riverside offers. Um, we utilize the GED tests for Riverside, so it's more of a competency base, but there's also classes taught in English, mathematics, science, and social studies. And uh, really, it, it, it's, it's been a very highly successful program. We, prior to this past year, we had three sections each year. Each section can hold about 14 students at a time. Last year, due to the, the impact of COVID, we added a fourth section to Riverside. So. Currently, we have uh, 56 slots that can be filled. Even with that, we still have a waiting list currently. It's about 44 students as of last week. Um, so that just kind of shows you the, the popularity of the program. Uh, even though we have 56 slots, as students move out of those slots, either because they complete the requirements of the program or because um, they're exited from the program, we can always place another student in there so many times there's more than one student throughout the course of the year that fills one of those slots. So the cost for the program is, is listed in the board report for each section. It's about $107,000. So if you think about that uh, total for all four sections, it's $438,513.60. Uh, there's an additional cost for testing fees that go along with uh, the GED test. So the total cost for the pro projected cost for the program for the 22-23 school year is $446,073.60. Any questions? I do. Yep. You said there's 44 kids on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. Are they in traditional school waiting for that opportunity or where? Yeah, so that it's actually about half as many as we would have during a typical year. So that's the good news. Um, not all of those students are, are seniors. So a lot of them are sophomores or juniors that are just waiting for a spot to fill. Okay. So a lot of them okay. will eventually make it into the program. Okay. Otherwise, for some students who may not make it into the program because their attendance isn't what we want to see or for other factors, could potentially go into like the New Start program, which we now have at both high schools that's exclusively for seniors, or we may have a different pathway for them as well. Any other, go ahead. Thank you. Do we track uh, data on the students who have entered the program in terms of how many completers do we have? Yes. Um, the, the fact that they would have one less transition to make from the standpoint that they're already at Fox Valley Tech, so they could move into Fox Valley Tech programs um, post-secondary. Uh, do we track any of those data? We do, and you'll be seeing all of that tomorrow morning at Education Committee. So. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Sure, thank you. I'm just gonna stay up here. Okay. All right, so that uh, completes our district administrator and supplemental reports. Um, we have no one signed up for non-agenda related public forum or agenda related public forum. So we're going to forego that. Um, I would like to entertain a, a quick five minute recess. I would need a motion in a second to. I'll, to I'll, I'll move that. I'll okay. second. All right, so moved by Karin, seconded by Wright. Please call the roll. <laughs> yes, aye. 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 Wyman. No. 
Let's Pardon. go. Aye. <laughs> Herzog. Aye. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. See you in five minutes. The Oshkosh Board of Education is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Board of Education is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Board of Education is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Board of Education is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Board of Education is currently in a break. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is Gov TV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly.
the Oshkosh Board of Education is currently in a break. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is GovTV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all Gov TV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Oshkosh Board of Education is currently in a break. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is GovTV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 101.9. Like us on Facebook at our Oshkosh Media page. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. Please stay with us. Coverage will resume shortly. Mr. Peschel, can I ask for a moment just to... Um, I guess I would challenge us what we just went through with all those administrative reports. A lot of those were reports that I think a lot of reading of information that we already had in front of us. So I guess I would challenge maybe going forward that was a couple hours of going through and some of them are very important but I think maybe there's a way that we can become more efficient with that where we're not reading slides that we already have been uh, sure. given to us. So I think just as we come out of that maybe reflected about what we just went through with all those reports that I'd like to see us a little more efficient with our time so sure. we can okay. take that up at the next agenda setting meeting okay thank you mm -hmm. all right go, uh, go ahead and meet us dr davis okay thank you um so thank you to the board of education for taking some time um, to discuss the important equity work that we've been conducting here as a district um, and as the community uh, and being willing to look towards the future for uh, for improvements um, this, this presentation tonight has been in development for the last uh, several months um, I've met with school board members, staff, uh, community members uh, regarding equity uh, in our school district uh, throughout this, this school year and my uh, initial observations. Uh, the timing of this presentation at the end of the school year is appropriate because it reflects, um, allows us to reflect as a system on our equity journey where we are at this point um, with celebrations and then certainly some uh, opportunities for improvement as we're moving forward. Our equity journey is not new um, or unique to Oshkosh. Uh, equitable or educational equ equity in our public schools is a national pursuit uh, that's essential to create uh, our poor, more perfect union proclaimed by our forefathers in the Constitution. Every local school district in the country has an obligation to continuously review their policies and procedures to ensure educational equity for all of its students. Uh, it's my honor to be able to serve with you as a school board and our staff um, that is and will continue to be committed to educational equity um, in our system and in our community. The most valuable asset we have as a district is our people, our students, staff, families, and our community members. We are growing stronger as a community as we become more diverse. Local diversity allows us to achieve meaningful relationships with people of different perspectives uh, and experiences, strengthening, strengthening our ability to understand ourselves uh, and the world around us better. That better understanding of ourselves and the world around us results in us being stronger as a community, both civically and economically, because we can more accurately respond to each other's needs uh, through improved policies, uh, some of which you'll see tonight, um, and products and services. The Ashkosh Area School District welcomes the opportunity to continue on the equity journey um, as part of the larger city of Oshkosh. 
Uh, due to the ongoing investigation between the ACLU and the Office of Civil Rights, we will not be discussing the recent allegations against the district. I do want to reiterate um, that, as I understand it, all individual complaints reported to the district have been followed up in accordance to our policies and administrative guidelines and that an independent hearing officer in the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction affirmed that our disciplinary actions in this case were aligned with our policies and administrative guidelines and with the law. As mentioned earlier, the purpose of tonight's review is to provide reflection as a, as a system on our equity journey this year uh, with celebrations and then opportunities for improvement. The data that you'll see tonight is our truth and we've, uh, as we follow our current policies administrative guidelines and processes. We are certainly not satisfied with our current results uh, and we have explored systemic changes to improve our outcomes uh, beginning next year. That is not to suggest that, the, uh, that there have been violations uh, of the law or school policies, but to suggest that we welcome the opportunity um, to work with our students, our staff, and our community members uh, to improve and do better. Tonight, uh, I'm introducing to the school board two systemic changes that will improve relationships and provide students with the, in, with the opportunity of support uh, that they need prior to uh, an expulsion process. Uh, one is the expectation of documentation of restorative practices, which will include professional development, which we'll get into tonight, uh, prior to suspension uh, from school programming or an exclusion from any school programming. Uh, and two, the, an expulsion of bans program that will provide academic and social emotional support uh, for students prior to expulsion. To be clear, this doesn't mean that we will not have su suspensions and expulsions um, as we move forward. There may be situations um, when these consequences are necessary to provide support for students and their peers. However, these two systemic changes approach behaviors as a form of student communication and allow us and allow our staff to better understand uh, and address student needs while establishing boundaries needed uh, to keep all of our students and our staff members safe and healthy. So I want to be able to provide that as a context as we now go through um, some of the uh, uh, proposed changes and to give you some context on what we've done up to this point and, and where, we're, where, we're, where we are uh, as we're moving forward. So again, as we talk about our um, strategic plan and our mission, um, principle, uh, our guiding principle being students first, um, committed to a, a collaborative culture, safe, safe learning and working environment, engaging all staff. These are, these are really core to our principles around equity and, and we continue to, to be uh, committed to all of that, our vision, missions, and values as we're moving forward. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Julie to talk about, um, mm -hmm. talk about our changing demographics. I think one of the important things to, to realize is that um, Oshkosh is a changing community. As I had mentioned, that's, I think, one of our greatest strengths now and as we're moving forward is our opportunity to understand ourselves and the world better. We're preparing students to be college, community, and career ready, and that means beyond the walls of their own homes, beyond the walls of our schools, um, to really embrace the, uh, the entire world. And so we wanted to, um, Julie's gonna provide some perspective on some of the, the changing demographics. It's really important that we stay grounded in, in who we are, um, not necessarily who we've been, and the opportunities that that comes with. So Julie. Um, so you, you stole a little bit of my introduction there. Sorry. So um, yeah. no, you're all good. So talking about demographics and if we're addressing the whole child and if we're making systemic change, we really need to understand the backgrounds um, that students are bringing to the classroom and bringing to our school district. So as you can see up here, you can see the change over time and we did six year intervals looking at this. So at the end of 2006, you can see where our enrollment is and then um, our enrollment according to students with disability, economically disadvantaged, English learners, and then by race and ethnicity. Then um, go, well actually this would be 10 years later, um, you would go out and you can see where how hard demographics have um, shifted and you can see the big shift is happening within um, our students of color and our students that identify as, as white. And then currently for the 2022, our current school district right now, you can see where our demographics are at that time. So from 2006 to 2016, another key shift also is with our students that are economically disadvantaged. You can see that from across the district. 
Also a key piece is, you've seen this in several different um, workshops, is this is our current demographics with numbers behind it because a lot of times we're not sure what those percentages mean when it comes to actual number of students. So this is um, the number of students that are behind those percentages in our current um, demographics when we take a look at that. So another piece that um, I have talked about in other data presentations is remembering that we may go back and we look at each of you know, students within a typical group, but we also know that backgrounds in our demographics intersect. And so just to be mindful of that in the Oshkosh Area School District, 56% of students with disabilities are economically disadvantaged. So take students with disabilities, take a look at just that group, 56% of them are qualify for free and reduced lunch. That's the criteria. When we look at English language learners, 73% of ELs, English learners, are economically disadvantaged. And with race and ethnicity, 32% of white students are economically disadvantaged or, class, or qualify for free and reduced lunch. 68% of students of color um, qualify for free and reduced lunch or are economically disadvantaged. And this is a really key point that as we start talking about um, what changes need to happen, they really do need to be looking at the system as a whole because our students and their backgrounds intersect in many different, many different ways. Um, one key data point that we're going to talk about today and that we're held accountable to is um, a lot of times we talk about school attendance. And with school attendance, uh, like the truancy um, term will come up. And so to clarify here, there's a difference between truancy and chronic absenteeism. And the state of Wisconsin, our federal accountability, has shifted from talking about truancy, which is like a local, it could be city ordinance, state statute piece of it, and has shifted to chronic absenteeism and talking about being chronically absent. And the reason is, is that when you're looking at absences, you are counting all absences, excused, unexcused, um, due to suspensions or other discipline consequences. It emphasizes academic impact of missed days. We're talking about it doesn't matter the reason why you're missing instructional minutes with your teacher in your classroom. And it uses community-based positive strategies because there's many different reasons that a student may not be in attendance for school. And so we want to know what's the cause behind those absences and how can we help and support rather than be punitive. So it shifts that by focusing on absenteeism. So the first set of data points that we're going to talk about, and it's very high level, is talking about chronic absenteeism. So this is our current school year. So from now, um, and I believe I pulled the data on May 2nd, 2022, um, we are looking at 13.6% of our students 4K through 12 meet the criteria for chronic absenteeism. And chronic absenteeism means that you've missed 10% um, or more of the instructional minutes available within a school year. I know this is high level, but that's a lot of kids yes. not showing up to school. Is there any data available as to like why? You know what I mean? And, and what type of interventions do we do to try to, because that's very troubling. 13.6% <laughs> kids not going to class. 13 points, 4K through 12. So for, for whatever reason, at any point in time, they're missing school. So you may, like, um, you know, if you have children in school and they're coming in, let's say, at 8.30 in the morning, it, like, it's they're checked in at 8.30. So let's say school started at 8 o'clock, that's 30 minutes that came off their instructional minutes. So we're talking about all absences, all pieces of students not being in school. For any given for any given reason, and so stay tuned when we get into things that we are talking about. Um, we have ideas, places, reasons um, that we are going to talk about with chronic absenteeism. So, okay. Okay. So, you're foreshadowing for us. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, I waited. sixty. Um, so, of those students that are chronically absent, um, sixty-seven point one percent of those students qualify for free and reduced lunch or economically disadvantaged. Students of color are 1.4 times more likely to be chronically absent than, um, than all other students. Um, black students are two times more likely to be chronically absent 
when you look at that group. And students who qualify for free and reduced lunch are 1.6 times more likely to be chronically absent. So when we look at that, knowing and understanding the backgrounds of our students and how our demographics intersect is, is a key point and will be, you will see some of that reflected as we go further in the data and into um, action steps. So if you also take a look at this, we know that if a student is chronically absent, one of the reasons they could be chronically absent or they're missing instructional minutes is because of, of discipline and some of that is out of school suspension. So um, the data was pulled on May 2nd, so this is this year's school data. 6.7% um, of students 4K through 12 have been suspended for one or more days, and that's students. <coughs> um, students of color are 1.6 times more likely than white students to be suspended. Black students are 3.2 times more likely to be sent suspended when compared to all other race and ethnicities. And students who identify as two or more races are 1.7 times more likely to be suspended when compared to all other ethnicities. So when you take a look at those numbers, we are not okay with that as a school district, and we have work to do. I have so, a, I have a question. Go ahead. Is 622 suspensions, is that 622 <coughs> separate students or 622? 622 separate students. Okay. So in all of this, this is our statement here. This is not to suggest staff have been discriminatory or have violated the law or school policy, but we really welcome the opportunity to do that. And so and our data is pointing to that we absolutely need to do better. So one of the areas that we look towards um, is uh, uh, research to be able to provide us some guidance of, of how we move forward because uh, we want to make sure that we're um, owning our, our truth and, and what our data is, but we also want to make sure that that doesn't pro provide paralysis um, that we're able to move forward. So some of the uh, research that, uh, that we've taken a look at in our uh, professional development circles um, is around uh, research done by Claude Steele uh, from uh, Stanford University. And I just want to provide just a glimpse of uh, of that uh, today. Uh, it's one of the things that I, I think, certainly it's a complex topic of closing achievement gaps, whether it's academically or as we're looking at things from a behavioral standpoint. Um, but uh, part of his research as a psychologist looked at um, the idea of, of stereotypes and spaces and how we, how we make sure that we can provide um, we can break through those stereotypes um, as they exist in particular spaces. And those may be school spaces, they might be community spaces, could be spaces um, really anywhere. Um, so uh, uh, one of the things that his research has shown um, from, and most of his research is at a post-secondary level, uh, but certainly I think does apply to the, to the K-12 level, um, is looking at what, what can we do to be able to reduce performance, uh, group performance gaps. Um, so as we would be looking at, um, you know, uh, males versus females. So one of his examples is looking at uh, female students in higher level math classes at the university, right? Where the stereotype would generally say that students, that uh, female students wouldn't do as well or may not perceive themselves as being able to do as well at the higher level classes. How do we counter those stereotypes uh, in that space? Um, and, and the importance of that. And when those stereotypes are countered and when people are felt um, welcome and affirmed in those spaces, his research would show that the performance of that historically uh, stereotyped group actually improved, thus like reducing the performance uh, gaps um, with particular um, stereotype groups. So that could be by race, that could be by gender. Um, so I offer um, you know, a, a good read being Whistling Vivaldi, um, which is a, a book that he wrote as a, a somewhat of a summary of his uh, of his research, um, which gives us some insight into moving forward. And, and one of the things that I pulled um, was just the idea, and, and I think this, res this resonated for me because there's, he had talks about really two spaces that are two things that you really need to focus on uh, that both need to be done in order to, um, to reduce the uh, group performance gap. So one is high quality instruction. So again, the idea is that nothing replaces good engaging high quality instruction that needs to be present in all of our classrooms. We know that draws students in, keeps them on task, and that's, that's really important. Um, what also resonated, though, in his research is that high-quality instruction itself isn't a means to the end goal for us to reduce these performance gaps. 
that you also have to have identity safety within that space. Um, so high quality instruction not being sufficient on its own to close gaps. So in other words, like in order to, to close our achievement gaps academically, we can't just say we're going to focus on, on instructional practices and teach our way out of it. That we really have to be conscious to the larger uh, social context that's going on and the stereotypes that may seem invisible to many of us because of our gender or because of our race or because of our conditions that we grew up in, but are certainly visible for many students and many families coming into our spaces. We have to understand those identities and where those identities are historically stereotyped in our spaces, and we have to be really active at disrupting those stereotypes uh, by building relationships with students, by drawing them in, by providing affirmation and feedback through instruction, right? And so there's a lot of intersection between high quality instruction and identity safety. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we see the, the utmost importance of diversifying our teaching staff is that when students come in a space and can see teachers that look like them, we know that those performances increase and as you do that in a group, and we see that if you take a gender example, we see that at our elementary schools. Historically, we have female teachers that are in elementary schools. When we, when we see you know, male teachers and that balance of male and female teachers, um, what that does to our boys to be able to see them affirmed in our space is really important. Certainly when we're looking at um, our students of color uh, in our spaces, you know, where do we see um, the academic examples of our uh, for our students of color uh, that would look like them uh, is really important. So, um, so that identity safety piece is, is really something that we have to, I think, do a better job of paying attention to and be conscious of and rolling that into our professional development as we're moving forward. So when you walk into a classroom as a freshman in high school, for example, you know, what do you see on the walls? What do you see in the hallways? You know, what is it that those voices in your head that you're worried about, what calms them and draws you into that space? Um, is part of what we um, talk about as part of our professional development and still have you know a long ways to go but um, I, I wanted to include this as, as a pathway forward again not to be stuck in, in you know uh, our performances at this point are, are not where we want them to be but how do we draw that forward um, Claude Steele's research provides us with somewhat of a path to that again there's other research around it but I just wanted to provide that as um, just a concrete example uh, and offer that as a resource um, moving forward that we'll we uh, integrate and we'll continue to integrate as part of our uh, professional development as we're moving forward so getting to these action steps and like what are we going to do because we can talk about things and, and theorize about um, you know what our work needs to be uh, but at the end of the day we need to put it into some action steps um, so I wanted to just highlight some action steps again some of which are, are new um, that we're going to go into some detail on uh, some of them are continuing some things that we've done either in past years or in this year uh, and then uh, some new activities uh, or a new activity that we're taking a look at. So um, the restorative practices incorporated into our suspension process, again, that's specifically a systemic change. That's an expectation that we'll have in our documentation as we're moving forward. Um, we'll uh, invest, as Matt will talk about, investing in our um, restorative practices, uh, professional development, um, and making sure that we're um, using our data to be able to drive some of these conversations. Um, and so let's go into detail on each one of these um, as we're moving forward and then Again, we can take questions uh, on any of them as we're as we're going. So, all right, <clears throat> all right. As Dr. Davis mentioned, one of the, the major changes we're making related to suspensions is incorporating a uh, restorative practices piece. And the reason that's important is we we know that suspensions don't change behavior, and um, by not having that restorative component, we're expecting behavior to change. Uh, just by sending students home. What restorative practices ultimately are going to do for us is create a situation where we're working with students to repair the harm, to resolve conflict, and putting steps in place so the behaviors that we're seeing don't become recurring behaviors. So in addition to the restorative piece, there's also a component where there's required documentation for how schools are going to transition students back from suspensions, which is just as important because if we don't set students up for success as they're returning, chances of those behaviors, like I said, recurring, uh, do increase. So when we when we think about restorative practices, um, you know, it's important that our educators, our, our administrators, our deans, our people service staff members 
have the necessary background to incorporate restorative practices properly. So we have worked with CESA 6 and in turn the, the Wisconsin Safe and Healthy Schools Network to set up two trainings for our administrators, our deans, and our pupil service staff. And we are gonna set up additional trainings uh, for September and probably early October for those pupil service staff who can't do the training over summer. Um, the first training is gonna be in June, it's a two day training, and the second is gonna be in August. But really what those trainings focus in on are you know, the, the key components to restorative practices, which are fairly flexible for those who know something about restorative practices, I think the most common thing people think of are restorative circles. And that's just one component. There could be a lot more that goes into it, um, which could include like uh, mediation, journaling, and other restorative interventions. Uh, so in terms of why restorative practices, I mean, it is a research-based approach. And really what it does is it addresses the underlying uh, causes for, for some of the behaviors that we're seeing. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice alternative to traditional discipline, which really relies on compliance and, and sometimes punishment, and instead focuses in on strengthening relationships and connections, and that's not only student to student, but also student to staff relationships. So again, it, it makes it less likely those behaviors are gonna uh, recur. It creates a more equitable and positive school culture, and then one of the pieces that I, I like most about it is that it really teaches problem solving skills to our students and it teaches them to take ownership of their behaviors, which is crucial. The other system level change that, that Dr. Davis mentioned is the creation of an expulsion abeyance program. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna give a very high level overview of what that's gonna look like, understanding that we're gonna be coming back at some point this summer with a lot more details of this particular program. So in an expulsion abeyance program, students who would typically go to expulsion take a different path. So instead of going to that expulsion, uh, they could potentially go uh, to an alternative setting uh, to where if they meet certain requirements, they would earn their way back into the regular school setting without having to go through an expulsion. Currently, we do have our Crossroads program in place, and in order to get into Crossroads, uh, which is one of the bigger drawbacks, is you actually have to be expelled from the district. And based on how our um, you know, expulsion orders are written, uh, there's an early reinstatement clause where Crossroads helps students to, to meet those early reinstatement requirements to get them back into school. So really, this advanced program would be on the front end of an expulsion, uh, which would really be better off for students in these situations. Um, in addition to being placed in this abeyance program uh, through the pre-expulsion process, there'd also be an avenue to place students in there uh, through IEP meetings, similar to how students are currently placed at our second chance program. Uh, it would be for students who uh, have an IEP that are, are really unsuccessful within the regular school setting. Uh, this would be a, another option for them. So essentially what this abeyance program would be doing is incorporating both our crossroads and our second chance programs together into one and um, um, really uh, utilizing the, the best pieces and components of both of those programs. So just for a few minor details, this program uh, would be capped at 30 students. We'd have two sessions, morning and afternoon. So between the two sessions uh, would be those 30 students. We'd have regular education, English and math teachers present as well as a program coordinator and special education staff members. Um, but the, the, the key piece to this is we would have a full-time school counselor on staff and we already have a half-time school social worker working out of our second chance program. So there'd be a very strong therapeutic uh, piece to this to where we're helping students um, with any social emotional needs or deficits that they may have. So those would be addressed through those staff members. Okay. Um, and then part of what we've um, been involved in was our diversity, equity, and um, team that we have been working with. Um, we really do want to consolidate our efforts. Um, we spent a year and a half doing some listening, but really what we did is as they asked questions, we shared out information each month about different pieces, and I think inadvertently, um, that made some people want to, like I think they really just wanted a voice, and so one of the things that we're looking at is doing focus groups in the fall to get their voice as well as many other voices to the table. Um, 
So that's coming up as part of the Equity Diversity Committee. Um, we're also um, talking with our school principals about how we can um, make sure we have voices at each of the school teams to know what's happening in our schools. So that is something that was very clearly heard um, in the Equity and Diversity Committee is they didn't know what was happening in each of their individual schools. Um, and then Wait, we also- In regards to what, what, I mean? As far as the equity work. And oh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Or, I thought or, you were concerned. Concerts or. You know, no, okay. so, as, yeah, because they just want to be involved in knowing what does that look like, what does that mean in our school, Got it. and how do we, you know, how do we get involved and, ha ha again, have a voice in that mm -hmm. effort. And then um, consolidating efforts in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility across the city. And so, um, I've been involved in watching the uh, city efforts of DEI and learning more about that um, and that's one of the areas that we're going to join that committee to learn more but we're also meeting with UW Oshkosh in the city to talk about how do we as a collective whole really move the work forward because we need everybody involved. Yeah. Can you go back to that? I can. <coughs> um, I guess you didn't really talk about the committee, at, oh, maybe you did. Um, I reversed it, but okay, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I realized that as I... Um, I think the diversity committee that was formed, mm -hmm. and is it still active? We, we last met in January, and okay. at that time, we, we had two people that came, and so that was where... When I say when we kept presenting different, like, questions came, and then we presented information, mm -hmm. We didn't, per, like, what we were trying to do is inform. What I think we did inadvertently do is make people believe that we didn't want to hear their voice, and that wasn't, that wasn't our intent, but I think that was the impact. Um, so, so we're going to be talking to that group as well to learn more, but we do want to come back and have discussions, but part of that was around focus groups in the fall, bringing their voice as well as others. Part of what we heard tonight also as part of the listening session prior to this was um, if we're uh, going to continue with the equity and diversity committee um, as a reset it needs to be there needs to be an explicit mission like mm -hmm. and, and yes. have it be yes. action based yes. Yes. that's something that really needs to happen and it really needs to be better defined um, than it was was uh, prior to mm -hmm. so that's something that will make sure happens and that's why I, I think you know this has an opportunity to be able to provide those focus groups but um, but Kim and I will reach out um, specifically to you know members in that group um, some of which were um, were were there um, at the uh, at the listening session and some who are, are still here mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to really engage in the process of like what is going to be a productive use of all of our time mm -hmm. um, and I think there's combinations of that between um, district level conversations but also specific conversations at local neighborhood schools mm -hmm. what's going on at the schools because that the action is what's going on at the schools and if there's we, we can talk a lot of at the district level about patterns and maybe ideas to stitch things together but it has to go I see it as a rhythm kind of back and forth between you know our schools and back at the district level so we're, we're gonna just work together to be able to structure that committee um, to make sure that we have some defined outcomes and, and sustainable structure that's going to be, um, you know, productive for everybody. Again, I'm kind of talking out loud here, so um, as I work through my thought, um, maybe it's not fully formed. What about looking at this once a year? I think everybody here can say is, is not enough, right? And trying to look at the data and trying to dig through it. We have enough committees as, as we we have a lot of committees already, um, but. In, in, a, in, a, in a way to hold you know accountable and where is the committee going what are we doing with it what's the uh, what's the outcome that we're looking for is a is a quarterly board committee that reviews diversity and the and, and the diversity committee can kind of report back to the to a subset to like a committee that way so that maybe not doing com workshops every quarter which I guess is fine or, or reports but to really get that engagement piece going, you know, and, and like I said, maybe it's not a fully formed thought, but is there some way that the board can be more involved with that? Because it is one of our strategic plans, right? It is one of our 
ideas, right? It's it's on the wall in here about you know being able to be respectful and inclusive and and everything else. So, you know, I guess I'd like to see maybe if there's more thoughts to to what we can do and be more involved in that. Yeah. So my my initial thought um, to that is uh, again making sure that we have a purpose, um, you know, at a board level, and, and I think. Um, the, a good beginning of that is, you know, the board, the board sets expectations and targets, mm -hmm. right, and kind of the, the what we want to hit, and then how we do that, right, is, is, you know, our team being able to work with students, families, community members uh, on, on that piece of it. So I, I think getting defined, you know, what, what measures we want to look at, you know, that we're monitoring, some of which, you know, we're here tonight, but at, at what extent, and then be able to translate that onto an annual, or onto a, the calendar, um, to be able to be really specific about what our targets are and what the frequency is as we're, as we're moving forward. Um, so, and, and let that define whether it's quarterly or semester or whatever the frequency happens yeah. to be. Um, you know, knowing that this, this, uh, this takes time, we got to build relationships, um, we're back at schools, going back and forth, um, you know, as we're as we're moving forward. So I, I just again want to make sure that we're purposeful, um, you know, with our with our actions, and that um, you know that, that we can we can work through it. So that that would just be my ask would be, you know, maybe we can do some work around some de some specific measures. So define um, what the committee's going to be, you know, and and then kind of see where we go from there. Is that kind of the? I, I I think as as collectively as a board, yeah. like. And, and the key measures should be in the strategic plan, right? Mm -hmm. And so yes. defining that and making sure that as a, as a board we're agreeing to a calendar that has specific times that we're reporting out those okay. measures. Like that, that's really helpful uh, for us because what what will happen then is is as we may have an incident come up, you know, somebody says, "Hey, we want to look at our we want to look at our data," right? Yeah. And it's that ping ponging that's difficult. Not that we can't do that, but having a predictable schedule um, is really helpful. And especially as we're reaching out to 20 buildings who are doing work and then coming coming together as a system, it's helpful to be able to report down, um, you know, from a board level down to the classroom level, you know, what things that we're looking at. So. That w that would be, uh, I guess, my feedback of where to of where to start from some of the conversations. Go ahead. Thank Thank you. I th I think most of us received an email from a community member um, raising some questions about uh, the district's uh, equity efforts, and I had a chance to talk with uh, an individual today who's a parent of um, some students of color and also at this listening session tonight and and one of my takeaways is that we need to listen <laughs> as to what these parents have to say yeah. instead of telling them all the good things that we're doing and we are and we need to <coughs> communicate that as well but it was um it was very meaningful to me to hear about the implicit bias and the microaggressions um, students who have their hair touched by other students. I mean, I most of us wouldn't want our hair touched by uh, other individuals, but yet these are things that we have students who experience on a regular basis. And so I think we need to listen more to what some of these individuals have to say who maybe don't look like those of us around this table um, so that we can learn from them because we don't know what it's like to be different, so to speak, and, and live in this community. And so that was one of my big takeaways, that, that we need to listen more and not tell them, not be telling, but listening to yeah. what they have to share with us. And so I hope, I hope that we can do that um, moving forward and then be up to administration, because that's, that's their role, to develop the plan then as to how we're going to uh, integrate those individuals. And as I was reflecting on tonight's meeting, it seemed to me that there were a couple of pieces in the strategic plan that are quite relevant. Uh, we've talked about these before, so these aren't anything new, but we, we want to improve learning outcomes. We want to en engage the community. That means all, we, we talk about this, we talk about this a lot. All means all. We need to involve all the parents. How are we, how can we do better to help your child be successful? Um, and we need to engage those, I think we need to engage those parents more as partners in the, in the education of their children. I like the other things we're talking about, the abeyance of, of expulsions and so on, but I think, I think we really need to reach out to um, uh, the, 
thirty percent of the uh, students who don't look like any of us around this table. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope we can we can do that and make sure that we're improving then learning outcomes for all students and looking at things like um, as as Mr. Karn suggested. I think we need to have more updates on this whole topic uh, and and be looking at enrollment in AP courses. Uh, the number of students who have across the district who are participating in GT. Um, and I'd like to see more data, quite honestly. Uh, going back to slide number eight, where we talk about 6.7% of grade 412 students have been suspended. I believe that was in a given year. But what, is that an improvement over the past, or is that not as good as in the past? Right. I'd like us to go back and look at data over uh, maybe 2014 to 2022 to see how we are doing in these areas, whether it's suspensions or expulsions, because just to look at one year's worth of data doesn't give a trend. True. And I'd like to know what the trend is and what the, are, are we going up or are we going down on, on some of those like suspensions and, and, tr and expulsions. So, so those are my thoughts. Matt or should we let them finish the presentation? Yeah, let's just sure. finish a couple slides and we can have questions, I guess. Right, that that okay. yeah. Or I could comment now, either way, I guess. Go ahead. All right. Um, no, I'll wait. Let's, let's okay. do it. Okay. <laughs> All right, and here's a slide you've seen before um, around our Integrated Comprehensive Systems for Equity Work, or ICS as we call it. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about especially the first three steps because it's an area that many of our schools we've gone through all of this however we're kind of we're continually coming back to some of these pieces so um, when we talk about that history of marginalization in our current model what we're really doing is we're looking at the oppression and marginalization that has happened uh, within um, not only our district but historically structurally culturally and systematically. And so um, as schools then, after we spend some time looking at that history, we also look at our schools and we're drawing diagrams about all the different programs and what is truly happening within our own school sites and then how are we going forward. So that, that whole piece of step one is a lot of internal work in looking at ourselves and our system um, and how do we go forth. Um, that second area of deficit to assets based thinking, that's a very big area that I do feel like we continually need to come back and revisit. Um, it, it really is thinking about how we say different pieces. And so like one of the, one of the pieces that um, some of you have been in education for a while and others are new, but you'll hear people say, yeah, we're pushing in for special education or something like that. That actually is, um, we, re we would prefer to say we're, pri we're providing services in a classroom um, instead of saying we're pushing in. So <coughs> there's like little pieces, but there's also bigger pieces about student first language, which I know we've talked to the full board about before in the past as well. Um, so lots of pieces around that. Um, another big area in the deficit to assess based thinking is looking at Paul Gorski's work on poverty and really going into that much deeper and um, looking at our own biases around those pieces as well. Um, and then the big piece with that is really taking a look at the cycle and deciding are our actions perpetuating or are they disrupting the cycle um, that it has been created, especially around societal poverty. Um, the next area is equity begins with us, that identity development for systems change. And so the, that, that whole area, it starts with our individual identity and looking at the levels of oppression and marginalization and truly getting into the microaggressions that are happening and to become more aware of that. Um, from the individual, we go into the institutional places. And Dr. Herzog, you were talking about where are we with advanced placement and GT. That's what they, they get into is when we start looking at the institutional pieces and what are we doing to start to move that. And so those are areas that we are looking 
more deeply at as well. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into the societal pieces. And when they talk about societal, um, one of the examples they give um, is about parental involvement. How even saying, we want to have parental involvement, but whose definition are we using for parental involvement? Um, most likely, it's our white middle class family's mm -hmm. definition. <coughs> and so there's several videos that are also a part of the modules to take a look at you know, how do we expand that definition and um, embrace a, di a different way of looking and thinking. So, um, so I, I share that with you because those are key pieces that even though we've gone through it, it doesn't mean that everybody's like, yes, and we have embraced and we're ready to move on. Many of our schools are coming back. We're doing mm -hmm. book, um, book reads and book discussions and going deeper or going back into the same work and looking at it again. And so I just wanted to let you know. Um, the other pieces, apply equity research. It really is looking at the research around equity and what are true facts, because there's a lot of um, pieces that people believe to be true, but then you see the actual facts of what is happening and it, it help, helps to change mindsets about what is real and what is not real. Um, the equity non-negotiables is an area that all the schools have spent time on. We have those ready to come to you um, to be a part of board policy. So that will be coming to you, I think, at the end of this month. Um, and then the last piece is that equity audit to drive change. And that has um, been an area where uh, not only did we have Hanover come in and do an equity audit of our district and then give us action steps, but also each school took a look at um, the modules of looking at uh, the strengths and weakness areas around equity for their schools. And that, so they did that last spring and they either shared it with their staff last spring or they shared it with staff this fall or both. <laughs> to really drive now where are we going as a school. And so, as you know, there is a lot to equity. And so each school is on that journey where they're exploring and it, it's going to be a continual cycle because it depends on where they are with this. But that's where when we talk about bringing in the parent voice and having them know what journey the school is on, that will be helpful to bring voice, their voice to it, but also understand where we are in the process and how we are bringing that forward. So, One quick question, are those first six steps cornerstone one? Yes, those are all cornerstone okay, one. Because it's not labeled that way. You're right. I don't know why that is not labeled, but that was probably something I did, That's or right. maybe that was a Google to um, PDF thing that happened, I'm not sure. <laughs> I thought you were just trying to make sure we were paying attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's the ticket, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one of the other pieces we're looking at is streamlining our multi-level system of support in our care team process. Um, having an effective multi-level system of support really allows schools uh, to meet the, the unique learning and educational needs of all of our students, whether they be academic, behavioral, social, emotional. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar what, with what a multi-level system of support is, really it's, it's just an educational model that shows how we can apply additional supports to students who need them. So at the base of a multi-level system of support, you have your universal support. So universal is something that all students receive and it, it's most commonly thought of in terms of our general curriculum. So what do all students get? That can include things like differentiation of instruction, it could include accommodations, modifications, additional things that we do to allow students to access the general curriculum that would still be considered universal. And when we think of the, the universal piece of our multi-level system of support, generally we're thinking about 85% of our population or so um, would would have their needs met through that universal piece. Now we know there are students who need something a little bit more than what we offer in that general curriculum. So the next step up would be uh, uh, the tier two or the secondary level of a multi-level system of support where we're providing you know, a, a little bit more, whether it be a small group to help meet a student's social emotional needs or maybe it's additional instruction in the area of literacy or mathematics. Um, a, a common tier two support that we have in our schools is related to PBIS and that's our check-in and check-out system. 
So those are more low-level uh, interventions uh, that we can apply to students, like I said, that need that a little bit more uh, than what's offered at the Universal, and typically that's about 12 to 13 percent of our population. And from there we have the tertiary level or a tier three level, and uh, those supports are really for students who have needs that go well beyond what's provided in our Universal. And um, for those situations, <coughs> Excuse me, in those situations, typically how we arrive at the supports that are applied to students is we have our care team process, which uh, allows our, our stakeholders within the school to come together and create detailed individualized plans that we can then put in place for students. So every school in our district has a care team process. There are some general components that are the same, but there uh, are care team processes that run much more effectively in some schools than others. So one of the things we're gonna be focusing on doing, like I said, is streamlining that care team process, making it more consistent, <coughs> bless you, and more effective across all of our schools. So uh, there are a number of ways that we're gonna be doing that. We have a, a care team guide that is gonna be distributed at the start of next year. It's kinda like a one-stop shop for everything that you need have an effective care team process so it's going to include our forms uh, real clear uh, description about uh, each component of care team and how it's meant to be implemented including fidelity checks it's also going to include a reference to our Oshkosh community intervention team process and that's something we've had in place for a while with varying degrees of success but we've been working with the Department of, of um, Human Services uh, the County Department to really uh, make sure that process is in place because what that does is once our schools feel like they've exhausted the resources that we have uh, we can then bring cases to the county where they may have uh, additional resources or supports that we either haven't thought of or that we don't have access to that they can use to help support our students and our families all right and then we have some different behavioral supports the one you've heard a lot about for probably a decade now is our positive behavioral and intervention support and that really is the framework that everything fits into um, but from there we've also um, this year we have been piloting Har um, harmony which is a social emotional learning we were trying to do it during COVID too but <coughs> we'll say this is the first mm -hmm. real year with it um, and really some resources tools and strategies to help teachers teach the social emotional learning that needs to take place. And then you've also heard a bit about conscious discipline this year. And again, that core, the core pieces of conscious discipline is around safety, connection, and problem solving. But then it also um, includes the seven powers or seven skills for our adults and understanding their, um, their brain states because we need them to be conscious of their reactions around conflict and so that they are choosing the response that is going to make the best sense for um, the students that are they are working with and so it really is about helping our adults be aware of their brain states and be in their executive state when working with students all right attendance matters campaign uh, so mr. Wright this is this is the, the response to the question you asked earlier about what we're going to do to address the 13.6 percent of students in our district who are, are chronically absent. So, um, I was only I was only like 45 minutes ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe an hour. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is something that's really exciting that we're going to be doing, uh, rolling out this summer and, and into next year. But uh, we're really putting a comprehensive campaign together to stress the importance of school attendance. Um, and it's something that we're not only doing within our district, but uh, it's something that we really want to incorporate throughout our community. So uh, when we talk about the campaign itself, there are three key components, community being one of them, our, our um, students and staff being another, and parents being that third component. So within each of those pieces, there are specific things that we're gonna be doing to target each of those populations. So uh, in terms of students and staff, we really want to embed the things that we're doing within this campaign into our PBIS uh, framework and structures because we have PBIS teams in place. They can really um, be that mechanism that pushes out the attendance uh, content to our students, incorporate best practice with our staff to really make sure that it's embedded within our schools. And really by doing so, we're making the focus 
um, especially with our staff, on creating welcoming environments for all of our students. Places where our students want to be, where they feel safe, and they feel welcome. Uh, along with that, we're, we're creating quite a bit of visual media uh, that promote attendance uh, that you will be seeing within our schools. Uh, in terms of parents, we really want to educate parents on the benefits, the importance of attendance, but also the implications of not attending school. So, um, you know, for many of our parents, um, you know, they, they get a lot of information from school. Um, and it's easy to to get inundated with a lot of the information that we're receiving. So we've been thinking about um, how we can create media that is easily consumable for parents. So what are the, the key points, the key facts that we really want parents to know? And what would be the easiest, most efficient way to, to get those facts across to our parents? So we've been um, looking at doing different things like creating rat cards or or uh, brochures that could be handed out at get to know you conferences, um, other school events where we have access to parents. We've talked about creating magnets that we're going to provide to every student in the district that have the start times for school at all three levels and web website address where parents can go to find the number for their school if their child is gonna be absent that particular day. And uh, we've also uh, worked with our social worker staff to try to identify what are the, the barriers that our families are experiencing related to attendance and what can we do systematically to help eliminate those barriers to make sure that our, our students don't have obstacles in their way in terms of them getting to school each day. And then finally, the third area that I mentioned is our community. We want to partner with key stakeholders to really make this a community initiative. So when you go to the gas station, grocery store, different places throughout our community, the same message is being heard, that we want our kids in school, we need our kids in school because it's something that not only affects our students, it not only affects our families, but it can be detrimental to our community if we have large uh, numbers of students who aren't attending. So in addition to that, we wanna also hit up uh, specific uh, stakeholders like our healthcare professionals and, and talk about the importance of scheduling appointments outside the school day about not writing blanket um, excuses for students to where they can miss you know large um, numbers of days of school at a, a specific time and just be very conscious about you know what they're uh, allowing or or what they're recommending for for their clients going forward <coughs> Since we're here now, to this point, it seems that, I don't know, I'm just guessing, or not guessing, but so 622 suspensions, for, what, 13, 1,400 kids with chronic, 1,254 kids with chronic absenteeism, right? We know that there's got to be a correlation there, right? Between um, the suspensions and... Not necessarily. Don't think so? It contributes to it. But you have to remember that, that when you talk about the number of students that have had one or more out-of-school suspensions, one out-of-school suspension is not going to be enough to... For the chronic guests. Right, exactly. And so when you think about missing 10% of school days, if there's a hundred there's 177 or 170 school days, we'll pick a number, 170 school days, then you're at 10%. You're missing set that you have to miss quite a bit of school in order yeah. to reach the level of chronic absenteeism. And then the question that's going to come up is going to be, um, but what about my child was told to be home in quarantine, etc., and all that? That was taken out of, and we um, did we exempted students that were out ill due to quarantine and were told to quarantine. So that the numbers when it comes to chronic absenteeism is they, they were not there or present for instruction. And that doesn't have anything to do with COVID, which is COVID out of the equation. Okay. I'll let you guys get through your last slide. Can we let them finish the presentation? Are you almost done? Um, and so the last piece, and this goes back to like looking at metrics and we're talking about the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, 
committee is what, are, what is our observable impact? And so these are metrics that we have talked about and are aligned to Strategic Plan 3.0. So the first one is decrease the percent of students meeting chronic absenteeism criteria. And we have action steps and strategies that we're going to put into place and monitor and say, are we making an impact? And that's aligned to goal one, uh, priority area five. Decrease the percent of students with one or more office discipline referrals. So an office discipline referral is getting, um, is the things that happen before you ever get to like a suspension. So what we want to do is monitoring internally, and we already do this, um, is like how can we decrease the percent of students um, that are <coughs> receiving discipline, uh, goal four, priority area three. Also decrease the percent of students with one or more suspensions, so that's looking at that number. Um, that's goal four, priority three. Increase academic performance as measured by state and district assessments. And so that goes back to what we look at annually um, from our state assessments, our school and district report cards, goal one, priority area one. And then the other piece is increased diversity in Oshkosh Area School District staff with an emphasis on licensed educators, um, goal three, priority area two. And so one thing that's been brought up is that, um, well, like, you know, we want to see data disaggregated this way, trends, etc. Absolutely, we do have all the <coughs> above metrics analyzed, reported, etc. The question is, is that where is you know where is that appropriate, and where do we want to be looking at the data? Because at times we can we can look at pages and pages and thousands of lines of data. My question is, is once we've identified the trend, what are we going to do about it? and what are those action steps. So here's what we're going to be monitoring. More importantly, and our community members and our families are saying this is, what are we doing about it? Where's the action for this? Comments? Anyone? Hi. Um, yep. Ms. Wyman? When we went through uh, the beginning of Oshkosh for Education, went to Mobile, Alabama, uh, the, I feel like this is a redo of all of that. Uh, the one thing that was so very important they talked to us about was making parents feel connected to the schools and getting parents in the door. And for many of the kids that were skipping school, the parents, well, they had to walk by a drug-laden area first to get to the school, which was problematic. But the parents were embarrassed to come into the school, so it was very easy. If some of the parents weren't educated, it was very easy for them to keep them home because why not? And once they were able to get the parents into the school to make them feel part of the school, education got a little bit easier. And I know that you were working with Garth, and, and I don't know if you are anymore, but that was something about individual plans for each student so each student could feel success, not as a group, but individual success, which made them want to do more. And I'm sure that's all part of this. Mm -hmm. But those were the two major things. And in Mobile, the theme was, yes, we can. And it was at every gas station. It was at every church. It was at every, every place. And everyone in Mobile knew that as, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. And it does have to be community. But my concern about this big, 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 big plan, how are we measuring really what it is that we want to measure? And do we have to wait five years for it? That it gets lost. So I want Dr. Davis to say, Beth, in six months, we're coming back, and we're going to tell you where we are. I don't think we can wait a year on this. If there aren't pieces in this plan that are achievable quick, we've got troubles. Sure. Mm -hmm. Ms. Carlin. I have a question for my fellow board members. Um, if we believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion are so important, why is this the last item on our agenda tonight? Why did we not move this up? And I'm kind of kicking myself right now because I made a, move, a movement to change the agenda and move the um, uh, comment section behind this workshop so that in case there were comments. But I, what I wish I would have done is, is move this workshop up to the beginning because this is by far our most important workshop. And um, 
it's uh, it's unfortunate that we began it on the third hour of a long night so going forward I would like to see these kind of workshops come first and have the reports um, come after so that we can engage the community and the, the parents that have waited here tonight to be part of this workshop my second comment is that I would like to echo what mr. Karn said about being more efficient with our reports um, Again, I think we've already kind of gone through that we don't need to be reading information that's on slides that have been given to us a couple of days. And I'd also like to take a moment to, to, and I'm guilty of this as well, but we need to come to these meetings prepared. Nothing in these presentations should be a surprise to us, and we should be respectful mm -hmm. of the presenters and let them finish their presentation before we start darting questions at them. So. I know it's been a long night, and thank you for indulging me on that little um, comment. I would also like to make the point that Dr. Herzog made that da this data is meaningless unless we have um, context behind it, and, and are we going up, are we going down? And I know we do not have a lot of that data because of the in interruption from the pandemic, but going forward, you know, I would like to see more benchmarks and more um, metrics that compare wh whether or not we're going up and down and these um, numbers and then I also wanted to comment um, on the fact that I've heard today that you know that kids are skipping school and in and, and a lot of these cases uh, they're not just skipping school they can't make it to school it's a transportation issue and what I like about what you have put together tonight is that you know um, I attended a poverty workshop with, um, through WASB at one of the annual meetings and they were talking about how these students have obstacles to getting to school and when they get to school what do we do we give them a tardy slip and the you know we can't we have to give we have to tell them that they're tardy and we can't the DPI requires us to track that kind of information but we can change the experience and we, instead of saying like you're late you're late we should say hey thanks for coming here and how about giving them a slip that says we're glad you made it yeah, and, and not shaming them into being late you know so I like that this plan has those kinds of action items in it um, and there was one other comment and then I'm done I promise um, I had a question on how the, uh, the your plan to increase diversity in the in staff is there is that flushed out yet or okay that's just no, long term. And I think that is an area that we will be working with the community as, as a whole with as well. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. so one thing I would like to look at, and I think we could probably do this and maybe the education committee, but is to look at how our busing initiative, where we partnered with the city to offer free transporta transportation for students, how that has maybe helped or hindered our ab chronic absenteeism. I don't know. I just... I know when we passed that resolution, the hope was that if students could have busing, that transportation wouldn't be an issue for coming to school. Um, so I'd love for us to look at that data, just kind of putting that out there. Um, I also, another bit, bit of data, it was noted that there's going to be a cap of 30 students total um, on one of those slides. That the second chant well I can't say the word audience a, a band thank you um, but I'm wondering how many students do we have currently between second chances and crossroads for do, or do we have a camp we have less <laughs> yeah I figured yeah. we're safe but I don't know <laughs> well in, in the, there's a there's a reason why we put a cap on it too not only um, you know when you get more students than that you have to look at possibly increasing staffing but uh, we don't want a program like that to turn into a dumping ground. So yeah. where we, we have students who we don't necessarily want at one of our schools, so let's let's try to streamline them into this particular program. Um, we really want to make sure that the students who we have in the abeyance program are students who otherwise would be going to expulsion. This is truly a pathway or an alternative that can get them back in the school, back on the right track. Um, and it really just fit well with second chance some of the same goals one of the things that we really want to do with our second chance students is figure out ways to get them back into the regular school setting because a lot of times our students who go to second chance end up staying at second chance and really um, that, that's not what we want for them um, we want them to be back with their peers in the regular high school setting so I, I think um, the the combination of those two programs is really going to work out well 
and um, to start we, we put the cap at 30 that's something that we'll continue to look at yeah. over time as well perfect thank you for helping me um, understand that better and I do want to say I like the whole combination because as you pointed out we are if we already have social workers and school counselors at both those sites to have them all together is going to be able to provide our students with more resources so um, I also wanted to say thank you for pointing out the intent versus the impact of the diversity committee um, because that was definitely something I heard from members of that committee too was that they wanted to be listened to more um, so I appreciate that we, you know, have publicly acknowledged that and that that's our goal going forward. And I think that that listening can be an opportunity to collect data as well. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Herzog kind of mentioned the implicit biases and the microaggressions that happen to our students at school. And I think that all of those instances are important data to collect because, as you pointed out, Ms. Conrad, once we have the information and the data, like, then what do we do with it? So if we know these things are happening at school, that kids are having these microaggressions from peers, maybe even sometimes, I don't know, um, that we then decide how to help the community and help their peers change and make sure that everyone feels safe at school. Yeah. That was all I have. Mr. Kearns? Yeah, I think um, we look at data points and we, we look at stuff all the time, and I like that you put numbers up there next to the percentages. 3,915 students are considered economically disadvantaged in our school district. That is, um, it's, it's terrible, and I think Starting the conversation listening to Ms. Lodge and Dr. Herzog talk about, you know, the committees and, and, and listening and listening to what we can do. Because a lot of times, many times, school districts are left to pick up the pieces for what's going on in the community. When it comes to um, free and reduced lunches, when it comes to other activities, um, we have to find a way. There's nobody below where, where we sit. And so when you're 68% or 60, I don't know how to word it right, but you're almost 70% more likely as a person of color in this community to be economically disadvantaged, right? So there's, there's things that, factors that we can't correct, but there's things that we can. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like the idea that we had, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Davis, you had said, like we want to see what are we going to be looking at? What, what's the outcomes of this? Where are we going with it? As Ms. Wyman said, right, what, what is the outcome of, of all of this? Because there's certain things we can't fix, but there's a lot of it that we can. And, and what of that are we going to, to see? And I am very anxious and excited to see a lot of this get put into practice, but also know that we don't have all the answers and a lot of that is listening to our community members who are some here tonight to what we can do to be better. And so I'm, I'm hopeful, but it's, it's always going to be a journey that we're gonna be on. So I, I challenge Dr. Davis, I challenge your team to really come back to us with where, what are we looking at? Just like literacy, right? What are we judging? What are we gonna be, you know, um, judging everybody on and what we're going to do. So thank you for putting this together. I, I do kind of agree it's rough that it's 10.04 and we're having such an important conversation, but that's for another time. But, but thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I agree. We, we need to listen, you know, and we need to continually, I mean, learn figure out different ways to to get better you know I mean the data is what it is and we're at where we're at um, but there's actionable things we talked about you know like tonight we talked about if we had more teachers of color that's shown to be beneficial we've we've talked about um, different steps that we can take and monitor, you know, and we need to, I think, do the best that we can to, to take those steps and then to 
you know, analyze where we're at. You know, I mean, and we got to follow, you know, use the best information that we have and uh, do the best that we can to move forward and follow the, the, the data, you know, and, and what we know can work actionably. So that's my thoughts. I don't have a lot of questions. Um, well, I guess just in the thought of like crossroads as a role in expulsions will no longer exist. Correct. Is that what I read? Yes. So then, um, and I'm not saying that we need to have an alternative if we have an expulsion, I guess, but what was, that's one of the things that we were using in, expul in expulsions to hopefully keep kids within the district and keep them connected, mm -hmm. is for them to go to that. So what do we, if we, if we continue with expulsions as our last, um, last option, what are we going to do to keep them in the district after that after that point? Yeah, and that's a good question. I think when you think about crossroads and, and the way it's utilized right now, um, you know, of, of those students who end up at crossroads, about fifty percent of them uh, meet the early reinstatement requirements to make it back into the regular school setting. So if, if we take that <coughs> program and we put it on the front end, there, there are gonna be students who aren't successful in an advanced program and end up going to expulsion. Um, with the structures and supports that we have in place in that program, they are, they are much, they're greater than they would be at crossroads. So if a student is unsuccessful within that advanced program and ends up going to expulsion, Chances are, if we still had crossroads in place with fewer supports, fewer structures, they probably wouldn't be successful in crossroads either. So that, that's, whether we need two programs, one on the front end and one on the back sure. end, it, it seems kind of redundant in a way. But if we did want options in place for students who continue to be expelled, or for, who end up being expelled, we can always look at virtual options you know, is, is one piece. Uh, we have the capability, whether it be through E-Academy, through Ingenuity, um, we can still keep students connected going that route. Sure. Uh, and I guess my, my other comment is, and it's, it's been asked of me, is why, why start this discussion with suspensions and, and expulsions? So, um, you know, uh, just in regards to framing the conversation, is there is there is there something that the community should understand from look at utilizing it, improving that situation, or reducing those situations that have a significant impact on uh, how it relates to the diverse elements of our community, or you know, something along those. Those lines. I know we understand what our data is, mm -hmm. but I guess the point is is that we've started with a negative instead of talking about starting with with the positives of where we could could go from. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly try to you know build into this report places that we can go from. Uh, you know, I, I think as, as our team kind of debated what the presentation would be. Um, you know, I, where we landed was <laughs> we have to live in our truth, and if we're if we're coming here to talk about <laughs> celebrations and place aspirations that we're having, and we don't we don't come out and say we're this is where we're at, that feels a little disingenuous and feels a little naive, <laughs> if you will, about like hey everything's fine, don't look behind the curtain, but everything's fine. Sure. So our approach was again not to. Not to get stuck necessarily in that negative approach, but to be real ab about like what are, where our data is, um, and be able to use research and our experiences programmatically to be able to move us like in, into the future uh, as we would go. So I mean, it certainly could go both ways. That's just that was our thought process and how we um, how we had put it together. Um, so yeah, I mean, certainly if you're looking at you know more of an asset based approach, um, we've got a lot of success stories that we can provide. You know, through a lot of our a lot of our programming, 
uh, which is part of our storytelling as we're moving forward. So there's there's always a balance. Um, again, this, this was an opportunity, you know, for us to be transparent with the community on you know where we're at for you know these data points and knowing that you know this is something that we felt is a is a high priority for us to address, um, both from a suspension and expulsion aspect of it. So um, certainly as we're moving forward, you know, having a having a, a larger conversation about academic achievement and you know opportunities. Um, I, th I think you always balance, right? So I mean if you're talking about the academic aspect and you're talking about the you know advanced placement, um, if you, if you're not achieving where you want to achieve, it's always in some ways going to feel like a deficit. You know what I mean? Sure. So I I, I think I, I think as I listen to some of the feedback in the listening session and you know listening here, I think maybe a balance, you know, is to be able to, to tell some stories about, you know, like here's some of the good things that are going on and here's some areas that we want to focus on that might be, you know, a way as, as we're, you know, moving forward. And um, as was mentioned, I mean this this is a journey. So this this is a these are regular conversations that we're gonna need to have. Uh, and this is part of Part of us working through the strength of what our community is and where we're headed um, is to be able to have these difficult conversations, do that in a way that's civil and constructive, um, and be able to listen to each other better. I think that's you know part of the themes as we're as we're moving forward. Sure. Um, uh, so I think for me this is, I mean we're we're talking about on a school level on a district level. Um, during the pandemic when the world was in unrest. Um, you know, I really had my, my hopes up that our, that our community was gonna have this greater conversation about um, equity, equality, diversity, um, and, and it didn't happen during that time. Um, and, and so I, so I generally have been um, pleased when the city created a diversity and equity and inclusion committee. I was pleased when, when we did it uh, internally. Um, I feel like our community is, is in some ways asking us to move forward in being, um, significant leaders in, in, in creating this change. Not creating, but creating the foundation for the change. Um, <clears throat> and so for, for me, I think the thing that I took out of the listening session today um, that I think is really important, and it's in addition to listening more, as Dr. Herzog uh, commented about, it's, um, it's where you listen that's important as well. Um, and, um, and, that's, and I think that's the one thing when, we, when we're hearing from parents is that we're, we, we're up here, right? As a board, we're, we're at the high level here. Um, and the reality is that um, all of this stuff is important that's being proposed, but that significant component of being at the schools and asking the students and the staff about um, and listening to that is is really important. And I think many times we get caught up at the administrative level and how it works. And even and I'm just going to be honest, even in this presentation, um, I got disconnected when we were talking about the research elements. It's not that I don't find it interesting because I wrote it down. I'm going to go back and read some more on it. But from a community level they get lost in that. And so there's, there's a disconnect there. We have to take that information and put it in a way that the people that we want to tell us about it, students, families, and staff, can, I don't know what the best word is, regurgitate back their stories to us about that. And so, um, and so don't make it so heavy. Find a way to make it easy and supportive for those stories to come out so that we can we can learn from those and we can shape our district and improve um, the educational experiences um, and leading up to the lives of the individuals that we're serving so 
um, that's just my, I guess, my general comments on it. So, again, it was a good presentation, um, but I, I guess I'm more interested in, in, in getting that, getting those stories, finding out. I want to find out more about how our students feel and how our parents feel, and to gather that information and, and, and then to put that in with everything else as well. Yeah, and that plays directly into the focus groups that we're looking yeah. at for the, for the fall. Yeah. So. Any other comments? Thank you for your presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, uh, we are under the consent agenda. For the consent agenda, the board has been furnished this background material on each item or has discussed it at a previous meeting. These items will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. We had that opportunity already. So looking for a motion to move the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Karn, seconded by Wright. Please call the roll. Hi. 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 Right. Hi. Aye. 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 Resolution carries. Thank you. We have no individually considered resolutions. Are there any requests for future agenda items? Mr. Carnes. All right. So I know this is not an item that we can uh, discuss, so I want to just kind of throw this out there that Mr. Wright and myself had a conversation about this. And I did some digging and I have a, a suggestion um, for going forward. Um, we have a lot of committees, talking about earlier, we look at a lot of different things. And we are involved, we're engaged, we understand what's going on with the schools. I think it would be beneficial for us um, to be more involved and, and aware of what's going on with our um, programs in schools. So the music programs, the athletic programs, and that kind of thing to be more engaged in, in, in getting reports back of how things are going. One of our strategic plan items is student engagement, right, is to make sure are our kids engaged, how many are going out for sports or different activities, how are those seasons going, how are the programs doing? And so we had a conversation and we talked about, and Mr. Wright had the idea of, of you know, a committee where, where that stuff gets reported back to. Um, we didn't go that route, so I actually reached out to Ted Knightsky and I asked him, what do other districts do when it comes to this? And he said a lot of them, maybe not a lot of them, some of them have it where an end of season report where the activities directors from each of the high schools will come in and give a report as to how the seasons went, um, here are the parent surveys, here's the engagement levels, here so how many people went out for sports. Uh, we know that, not only sports, but music, forensics, everything else, because we know that the more kids are engaged in their community, in the, in the schools, uh, the more successful they can be. And so I would propose that we have that happen where end of season, where the activities directors can come in and give us an update to different events and different activities and it allows us, we still stay above the line. Um, they just kind of report back high level how the seasons went, what it looks like, you know, what the parents, how, how the season went, how many people went out, how many people went, you know, joined forensics or, or different clubs. Um, but it does allow if we see a trend where a certain program is struggling or there's been a con continuous poor pay uh, surveys from the parents or from the students, it allows us to look into that further maybe and say, hey, you know, maybe there's got to be a change on that level or maybe there's something that we can ask to be looked at. And so, for Ted's suggestion, he said the three items you want to look at our participation and student experience, uh, customer satisfaction, and then financials. So those are the items that would be reported on based on those activities so that we can have a feel for what's going on in our schools. 
I guess I'll turn it over to Mr. Wright if he has anything to add to no, that. No, I just, I was thinking of it more of just, an, you know, like um, an update, you know, as far as participation levels, as far as um, spending levels, et cetera, to see if there's any equity issues, you know, as far as um, if uh, numbers are way down, you know, in activity, as far as activity levels are concerned, you know, we can get updates as to how, um, you know, as to how, how things are going and so we can have that information regarding, um, you know, athletics and extracurriculars. Simply because, you know, we monitor and get updates on all kinds of different things, you know, um, literacy, facilities, you know, all kinds of things district-wide. Um, it'd be nice to get some information in regards to um, participation, activity levels, et cetera, uh, when it comes to, you know, those other items as well, so. Well, we, to go back, we talk about um, retention of students, right? And so maybe you can see a trend of are people leaving because of certain activities or coming in because of certain activities? And, and we look at it from an academic perspective, but I think there's maybe another level to that too to be able to, to review. So yeah. there's a lot of information there. We can maybe talk. One agenda. Yeah. Agenda. We can talk more about that, but that's the suggestion that we. Yeah, so what I heard just in, in really quickly was a future agenda item around measuring student engagement. And a lot of details would need to be flushed out, mm -hmm. I think, with that. But I think the intent is student, how are we engaging students beyond the classroom yeah. Um, yeah. and monitoring, having some indicators that would, that would, show, that would show that. I, we certainly have to, um, I think, be, uh, be conscious of kind of our role from a mm -hmm. board standpoint right. and when we're, right. when we're looking at you know, a, a lot of different levels to make sure that, that we know kind of what, why we're measuring it and, you know, what's to, what's to come of that because that could pretty quickly get into some operational mm -hmm. uh, decisions that our athletic directors or yeah. principals would, would want to get into. So um, so I think we can flush out, uh, again, the student, the, the system level, you know, uh, system level student engagement beyond mm -hmm. the classroom can be a place to to start and just define that again as a as somewhat of a dashboard of indicators of you know things that we're looking at along with literacy um, and and that type of thing and some of the things that we saw that we saw tonight. Yep. Yeah, it's just a different level of just information in a different area. I guess. Sure. You know. Okay. Miss Carlin. Yes, I would like to put on a future agenda item, uh, much like we are working on legislative committee to make the voucher. Um, process transparent I would like us to take a look at making the public records request process more transparent I think the taxpayer would be interested in knowing how much money and time we spend on open records requests that are often requested um, for phishing or journalists or sometimes we don't even know why they're requested but we're spending significant amount of money and resources on these open records requests and so I, I think we need to put some transparency around that. Good. Any clarifications? No, I mean we, okay. we could we can talk you know, we can talk about what that format would be and you know pull samples from you know maybe the last six months yeah. and what okay. those requests look like and what and we can talk more about them. Yeah, All thank right. you. Any other requests for future agenda items? All right, seeing none, uh, any announcements? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Moved by Salaji, seconded by Wright. Please call the roll. Salaji. Aye. Wright. Aye. Aye. Carlin. Aye. 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 Aye